They come from the bowels of hell. It's the Dana Gould Hour. Jungle worms and swamp rats run around your feet. I bought a dog that killed the calf that ate the canary. What is truth? And once again, welcome back. Hello, and welcome back to the Dana Gould Hour podcast. It's September. Pumpkin spice lattes are back on sale. The Halloween aisles are up and stocked at stores like Target and CVS. Halloween mazers are getting ready to open, and here in Los Angeles, temperatures are dipping down out of the low hundreds to the high 90s and low hundreds. Here at the Dana Gould Hour podcast, we are raring to go. Sam Morell is here. Sam is one of the best comedians out there right now. Hands down, flat out, done. His special, You've Changed, is currently on Amazon Prime. And his previous Netflix special, Same Time Tomorrow, is now available on his YouTube channel. One of the best. Sam Morell is here. Also, in our second half, moving into our holiday mood, Orenda Fink is here. Now, music fans will know Orenda Fink as the co-founder of Azure Ray. She's also performed with Rilo Kylie and The Faint, among others, and she has a new book out entitled The Witch's Daughter, which is a memoir of her childhood with a mother who was a self-proclaimed witch. Whether she has supernatural powers or not remains to be proven, but she has put a lot of time and energy into casting spells and the like. It is an entertaining and sometimes harrowing story, to be completely honest, and she is here to talk about it, Orenda Fink. True Tales from Weirdsville takes you through the past 80 years of UFO history here in America, from the famous Kenneth Arnold Mount Rainier sighting that coined the phrase Flying Saucer in 1947, to the revelation in the pages of the New York Times of the Department of Defense's Office of Aerospace Threat Identification. And, along the way, one of my favorite topics, UFO religions. What am I up to? Oh, dear. On September 5th, 6th, and 7th, I will be at the Acme Comedy Club in beautiful Minneapolis, Minnesota. If you're in the Los Angeles area on September 14th, Dr. Z will be hosting the Mummies at Alex's Bar in Long Beach. That's going to be fun and hot. I imagine lots going on in October, and we'll talk about that next month. But I will say, on October 24th, it's Plan 9 from Outer Space Live at Largo with an all-star cast that I will divulge next month. Couple of new faces, couple of old pals. We're very excited. And in November, I will be back in San Francisco at the Punchline, as well as the Laughing Tap in Milwaukee, where I've never been before. M not the Milwaukee, but the club. And I'm looking forward to it. But that's in November. We don't have to worry about that now. As I've said before, the show is brought to you by you. We are paid for by our Patreon. So if you like the show, please consider becoming a Dana Gould Hour Sky Cadet. Go to danagouldhour.com and sign up for our Patreon. Five bucks a month. Get you some extra audio content, some video content, and some other junk. Yeah, you might hear a dynamic ad dropped in here and there. It just goes to help pay for the show. This has always been, after 13 seasons, a break-even at best venture. So do not let me be your business manager. But people seem to like it, and I really love doing it. So we're going to keep going. And you can always find the ad-free version posted on our Patreon page. And now, it's on to our filthy business. Dana Gould Hour. Free and worth it.
It's a sun dapple day high atop the Mulholland Drive view shelf here in sunny Southern California. I'm talking to one of the fastest rising young hot comedy talents in the country. Um, he's uh, he's a very, he's he's an incredibly funny uh, comedian uh, and uh, a, a, a good friend of mine. Uh, please welcome America's little brother, Sam Morell. Thanks, dude. Good. To, I, good to, I don't see you enough. I know. Well, we used to, uh, Sam uh, and I, at the height of the pandemic, uh, wrote a pilot together by Zoom. And uh, we used to spend every morning together. And then we would submit our script and get horribly berated uh, oh yeah but it was still fun as hell it's fun i learned a lot i learned a lot from you so it was cool my 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 apologies um yeah <laughs> learned you learned how not to take notes that's the best thing uh i, I, taking think, we, notes, I think we made a cool thing but we did taking notes is an art uh yeah that, uh i haven't quite curated yeah. mike scully who ran the simpsons when i was there but with well, but my for part of the time I was there, Al Jean. He, ran he it. wrote. Uh, he wrote. Uh, Lisa on Ice, maybe my favorite episode. Yeah. He we would get notes, and he would just because he uh, the Simpsons didn't get notes. The 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 genius of the Simpsons, and I, we're not here to talk about me or my career. Uh, Jim Brooks, when the Simpsons was made, he was like, "Here's the show. Here's the deal. I'm going to give you the show, and you're going to air it." And Fox was like, "Great," but then they need to give you notes. That you know they need to feel invested in the show, and Jim's like, I don't care. And like ten years into the run of the show, they were like, we want to test it. We want to put the show through testing to see what people like about it and and not like about it. And we can. And he was like, Well, you can. I have no interest in what you learn. Um, so they tested it anyway, and they found out that people like yellow. <laughs> That's what they learned. Yeah. Um, but they would give us notes on other stuff like, uh, you guys are one, you know, like you're drinking a lot of soda. <laughs> As a note. <laughs> yeah. Like, because they couldn't give us notes on the scripts. They'd give us notes the, the on note, the note uh, is, uh, our production comedians budget. are not healthy. Yeah. yeah no, that was really true. There was, <laughs> we would, every day we would get, uh, uh, we would have a uh, Starbucks. We'd have lunch, and then we'd have a Starbucks run at about three. Yeah. And they started to add Jamba Juice into the Starbucks run because it was right next door. And then on a blue moon, we would stay late. On a, you know, because we had it down by that time. And on a blue moon, we'd stay late and get a pizza. Um, for, <laughs> one day they get this note. I'm um, looking at uh, March fifteenth. You got you guys can't get pizza and juice. Holy shit. <laughs> the guy is calling from the a building. Show. The guy's the calling show. from a building the show paid for. <laughs> oh my God. You can't that, get pizza. That conversation should be more like expensive and time wasting than than just ordering a pizza. It's yeah. insane. But Mike would brilliantly huh. say on notes, because I we did a pilot together too, and uh Mike would just go, Yeah, look at that. Yeah, look at that. Yeah, look at that. Sometimes notes are good. Notes can be great. Uh, you get you an know. insight into, into dating someone, I think, on how they receive notes. Because it's how I get feedback, too. I'm like, <laughs> I'm like, fuck that. Fuck that. I'm not changing, you know? <laughs> That's who I am. <laughs> yeah. Fuck you. Oh, fuck you. Fuck you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, God, you're still... Um, so, uh, yeah, let, let's... Uh, you're, you're in New York. You just... For people... Uh, that want to see uh your is your is you've changed is now out on amazon prime it's on it's your, prime video is yeah. it your fourth hour long i don't even know i don't know how to count them anymore because i did a half hour for comedy central and no, they all in count every special every special with a title yeah. is a special you did yeah, 2015 and then, and then that had an album with us and the album right. was i think an hour and then uh give us I the did. titles give this give us the titles. that was that was called Class Act. That was the album, and then the the special was a half hour on Comedy Central. Then there was uh, an hour on Comedy Central called Positive Influence. Right. Then there was an, an hour on YouTube called You Change, which was like the biggest pop I got probably because right. that's the height of the pandemic. YouTube. Then there was uh, the rooftop thing I did, which was just me huh. not trying not to have a mental breakdown. Right, because it was during the, it so. was during the pandemic. That was when we were working together. 
Yeah, and then and then there was uh, I did a Netflix one it's called Same Time Tomorrow, and this is uh, You've Changed on Amazon. Right, but you so you had two called You've Changed. No, no. Uh, same time tomorrow was Netflix, and I got this was the other. I, I've no, got this. this. I've got one. this. Right. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 Um, yeah. You've changed this. The the one with the is that the one with the wine story? The wine. The, wine. the girl spilling the bottle of wine in your bed and making yes. it up to you by grabbing your junk. Their story. <laughs> and she, but it's, it's such a brilliant. <laughs> tell the story, dude. You know what's crazy about that story is she. She was messaging me after. She would just kind of mess with me. And, and we should uh, say this woman is now Kamala Harris, which is a very interesting weird pretty, thing. <laughs> pretty cool. She, she loves Jews, dude. <laughs> yeah, you're you're in. Yeah, we and had she the, brings we, a bottle of wine into bed, so you immediately go, rookie move. <laughs> yeah, I wasn't thrilled about it. And she, it's weird. We hung out once, and she was so cool. And then the next time we hung out, she just sucked. It was like a dip. It was like Two Face. It was I, the first time we hung out. She was just saying all the right things. She was. We had like a good banter. And the next time, she was just kind of like gaslighting me, just like everything. She, she would just fuck with me and then act like I was being weird. Because and she apologized later. She messaged me. She goes, "I thought about what you were saying, and you were right. Uh, we should hang out again." I was like, "No, I don't want to fucking hang out with you." But, but I did. Uh, I it's did like getting, it's like your car getting a text from a tree it ran into. I really shouldn't have she, been in the road. And she did the thing that a lot of people do to us where she was like, just don't do this on stage. And I'm always like, oh, yeah, I'll never. But in this one, I was like, oh, I, I am. I'm already doing it on stage. <laughs> yeah, and I, I won't mention your t- name. <laughs> I won't. Yeah, you won't use your name. But I sent her a tidbit and she was like, she was like, all right, fuck, that's pretty good. It was already, it was like in the beginning stages. And she was like, it is pretty funny. Uh, and then she sent me a text like six months later, like, I'd appreciate it if you didn't use that in your hour special and i was like oh no it's already it's too late it's yeah. taped <laughs> I'm, my, I'm using it my ex-wife was driving in the car and a bit of mine came on serious and she texted me like you know this we we have an agreement to not do this um and i had to go i i agree with you i honor that agreement that bit was from when we were married <laughs> that bit is from 2010 she was responsible for putting game of thrones on television that's and, incredible and i'd never watched it all the way through which i think she took as an affront which i can't say i've never seen for. it uh and then i just i missed like the first three episodes and then it was just like well i can't i don't have and we had little kids it's like i don't i don't have five hours to catch up i know they, yeah, yeah you I, just let it go i don't have kids i just thought it looks fucking nerdy i it, it i don't <laughs> well, know I, I i i hear it's brilliant like everyone tells me it's like the greatest show but yeah but you know, like by the time you get into it, like I was into the wire late. I got to a lot of these yeah, great you shows. Get into, you get into things late, and and it's not like you watch a show. Like it used to be, like I, I watch Quincy. It's on Wednesdays at nine, or like whatever <laughs> show you used you know used to watch. Like I watch this. It's on you know Cheers was like Thursday nights at nine. I watch Cheers or Seinfeld Thursday nights at nine thirty. I watch that. Now it's just like, do you want to watch ER? It's 14 seasons and you watch it all the way through. Like, that's what my kids do. My like, no kids, kidding. Grace Anatomy you just is like watch a show. Two seasons. It's and like- Grace Anatomy is the show. For whatever reason, I have three daughters, teenager, early 20s. They've all watched Grace Anatomy, but they start at the beginning and they move all the way through. And that's all they watch for a month. And now it's One Tree Hill or something. And they start at the beginning and they move all the way through. So it's. It's not like it used to be, and also because of phones and pads and stuff, you can just watch it all the time. Back yeah. then, in the early aughts, like I had to sit in front of a TV and watch Game of Thrones, and I don't have that much time. It's tough. I man. like that I, stuff. I like nerdy. Yeah. I mean, you know me. I like nerdy crap. Yeah. But uh, <laughs> I don't dislike it. I just I've never we I've never seen Lord of the Rings. I've never seen fucking most of the Harry Potter movies. I, I'm just. I don't know why I just missed. I think it was like the part of my youth that I just was like, ah, eh, fuck that. It's an acqui- that- I mean, it's an acquired taste. It's like I'm not like uh, I'm not like a super sports dude. Yeah, but like I can 
go into the Star Trek lore, if you want, you know, if we would like I, to bore each I other like blind, the, we should. No, I like Star Wars, and I like. I, I, it's not like I write all that shit off. Obviously, if it's a good, if it's a good thing, it's good, and it transcends yeah. the genre. But like, uh, and the Star Trek stuff I've seen, I like. Yeah. I liked but it a lot. We would not be in the same clique in high school. No, but that's kind of I think. What <laughs> I think that almost makes us like better friends now. It's funny how everything in life is just high school evolved. Martin Mall once called show business high school with money, which is just the brilliant. <laughs> yeah. Well, dude, that's what that's what the critics are. You're like, oh, you were like, you kept to yourself. You got some anger. This is where you get it out. I hate to say this, but like, I, I love Elvis Costello. Like he's my, one of my like top five. Oh yeah. Uh, David Lee Roth once said, not unaccurately. Rock critics, rock critics love Elvis Costello because they look like him. <laughs> it's like, you know, I can't argue that point. <laughs> yeah, that's true. Um, but I, yeah, I like Elvis Costello too. You got me into some of his songs. You showed oh, me yeah. some of his songs. Yeah. But so you, so you're, you're living in New York. Like you're at the, you do, here's the funny thing. You don't know this. I don't think you know this. But you're like, you will look back on this period of your life as the good old days. Like you are, you're, you're in New York. You've got a great apartment. You're single. You're working. Like I know no, that I'm, I'm in a, you're I'm caught up a in the, you're caught up in the day to day of it all. But like you yeah. are in your high dudgeon right now. I hope you're enjoying yeah. it. Yeah, my girlfriend will be bummed to hear that I'm single. But, oh, uh, well, I didn't know. Uh, you, I didn't know you had a. I didn't know no. you had a girlfriend. No, no, you're right though. This is the. These are. I know that these are the best. Do times, you want me dude. to tell I, her? I, uh, yeah, we got to end it to make that sentence. I want everything you say to be true, so we gotta. We gotta end it. Um, no, dude, I, I feel it. I really do. Like last year, we did a tour bus, and it was. It's insane. I. I was. I'm aware that this is. I'm with my friend Gary Veter, who I tour with, who mm -hmm. I was an open micer with. So I've known him through the bad times, and I. I love him and. Uh, it's, it's crazy. It's yeah. crazy to be, uh, just, I, I, I'm busy, but I, I like being busy. And yeah, it's, sure. Uh, yeah. And it's, I'm literally, I'm doing the road the way I always thought I'd do the road. If I had access to the things I wanted, which is we're, li we're watching last, last year we did a tour bus, get a good meal, hop on. We threw on the big heat, the Fritz Lang movie on the bus. We're getting <laughs> drunk on wine. And uh -huh. I was like, this is how I always want to do the the road. Right. Watch a film noir, get lit up drunk, and then wake up in a new city and go to the YMCA. You sleep on the you, you sleep on the bus. I love it. Yeah, yeah, it's awesome. Let me ask you so let me ask you a question. You made you made the jump from clubs to to, to theaters. I still do clubs though. I'm right. doing but a club you do this like weekend. the tour was the tour was on a bus theater to theater to theater to theater. Yeah. Um, which is a jump I never made, which is uh, admirable. And that must be I mean, I've certainly been on tours like that, but somebody else's. Um But that's because comedy is different now. I mean, like if you were if oh, you, you know, start I'm not, I'm not the, yeah, I'm I'm not bemoaning it. I just like but yeah. it, it must be a very it must be very satisfying to to know like, oh, okay, I definitely made, I definitely made that leap. I definitely made a step up. Like I get promoted. I'm a, I'm a, I'm a, I'm not a private anymore. I'm a corporal. <laughs> like, like you, it, the, One of the satisfying things that played a club uh, a couple of weeks ago that treated me like absolute dog shit when I was a young comic. So <laughs> yeah. that it is satisfying being like, oh, you paid me like shit. You put me in the rape motel. Uh, where a friend of mine actually almost got raped and sure. I'm like, well, you got, you should stop putting women in the, in the, yeah. it's, it's actually called the rape motel. So. Yeah, I know. You'd think like, right out of the gate. Weird. Out yeah. of the gate, you think you should not do that, but. Yeah. Uh, uh, there, there are those clubs. I once got in an argument with a guy, uh, a club owner because the condo complex wouldn't give you the key to the laundry room because a comic had lost it. And I said like, <laughs> I said like, could you let me in? I, I said, fine. Could you let me in? No. <laughs> it's it's amazing. So, some comic has ruined it for everyone else at every club. Like you yeah. go to a club now and they're like, hey, can I get a drink? They're like, 
two fifty, and you're like two fifty. They're like, yeah, uh, Vic Henley came here in ninety nine and had six bottles of Patron in three nights. So we have to charge you now. Yeah, there's, there's always or, some rule. Or John Fox. <laughs> John oh, Fox was the guy name. that I I went my touring days were always in John Fox's wake. It's like you can't go in the green room. John Fox was there three weeks ago. The CDC hasn't cleared it yet. <laughs> <laughs> I mean that it's it's so gross, man. I heard stories about that guy, and uh, it, but you know I go back into these clubs and like I'm, if the, if they were cool with me on the way up, I'm super cool. But if you were a dick to me on the way up, I'm like, yep, you gotta you gotta do this, you gotta do that. I, I'm yep. like, yeah, it's, it's time for a little fucking revenge. It is, and it's also you know people like when you meet like when you meet people that are writers, like because uh, that that never really that were comedians, but you know the the guys are mostly writers. Like you never understood the kind of carnival lifestyle that going on the road is especially when you're starting out like it's just yeah like you're hoping to not get raped <laughs> you, know? you know it's like it's like, it's I, like when, we, when i see a young female maintaining your road, sexual sovereignty is aspirational I, it is crazy I, I i see that i see the shit we do as men and i'm like man if women have to do this i'm i'm blown away that they have to so yeah i i wouldn't uh i i know i i don't know how they i don't know how they do it i don't know how they do it that's why um, every season road comic who's a woman you're like there's like a fucking hard edge and there should be yeah yeah they'll kill you as they'll well kill they, you. as well they should <laughs> now to that yeah. end you're not dating a comedian or are you no 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 as my friend dan saint germain always says uh two headshots in a relationship don't do it i've done it plenty I, i've done it sure. a good amount and there's benefits to dating comics uh but i'm i, I i'm good on that i think for yeah. at least a while it's it's a rush at first you're like oh this is uh, this is wrong i shouldn't be doing this <laughs> and then uh and then you're with them and it's hard to get out because you're like, ah, it's fucking, you know, it's so same schedule. They do understand a lot of stuff, but mm -hmm. end of the day, it's, it's, it's very, there's a lot of challenges. Yeah. It's, uh, too many masks. <laughs> a lot of masks. <laughs> That's yeah. so true. And also just, just, just figuring out when you're going to see them. You don't want to be upset with someone for getting, a road weekend or, or a cool gig in a movie or something. You don't want to be like, oh, you don't want that to be a reaction. But when there's two of you and there's already so little time you get to spend together, yeah, you start to almost get annoyed when the other person has success, not even in a competitive way, but in a way where you're like, well, now I never see you. Yeah. I don't know of any, I know a comedian couple that were, that were married. They're not still married. I don't know of any, I mean, there was, Stiller and Mira, but they were a team. Yeah, you know? that's true. But you know, which is ben also and, hard. That's also, also very hard. But at least you're you're light, you're you're together, and your life is consistent. But you know, Ben, their son, Ben Stiller, was was telling me like, yeah, he went to Vegas when his parents were opening for Gladys Knight and the Pips at some casino in Vegas. And the pips taught him to swim at the hotel pool. And he's like, I thought the pips taught everybody how to swim. You know? <laughs> it's like, it's just your life. It's just your life. And it's a strange life. But, uh, you know, uh, Moon is Zappa amazing. is on uh, Marin's podcast. And she's talking about how, like, in L.A., her kids were like the Kennedys, which is true. Like, they were royalty, you know, hipster royalty in L.A. And it's just, it's what you take. It's what you take for granted. You don't know that what your experience is not universal. You don't know that your experience is different. Um, which leads me to to your question, because this is something we talked about. Um, you uh you are adopted, but you're you're uh on on terms with your biological father and as it's your joke or Joe DeRosa's. If you call him your biological father, you're probably That's mine, not. A, yeah. yeah, it's yours. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Joe DeRosa's like, got a great joke, too, where he say, I love Joe's joke, where he said, uh, you ever try to find your real parents? He goes, uh, no, I took the hint, actually. <laughs> I 
I am not. I'm not. I hate the term. Joe was actually adopted. I was. That sounds like when I say adopted, people say adopted for me because the term was legally adopted when I was uh, when my when my dad who you know married my mom. My mom was yeah, always around. T- tell so, your tell your story. Tell 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 oh, your story yeah. for for people that, that was, for people that, was that another, don't know. That was I'm, another joke too. I think I said okay. illegal. Well, they call it legally adopted, which is like you can just say adopted. I've never what's illegally adopted <laughs> is kidnapping. You know, uh, so. But yeah, my mom just, I don't know the full story to be honest. Cause I, I don't really ask her. I, I just feel weird asking her. It's, uh, I know that there was either, you know, I think it was a brief relationship with who my biological father is, who, uh, yeah, I just, I, I met him. But your, mo- your mother is your biological mother. Yeah. And then okay. she met a guy who is my, who I call dad. He was right. technically my stepdad, but he's a great dad. I, so when I, it's tough when you talk about this stuff on stage and people are like, oh, and you're like, no, 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 you don't understand. This worked out fucking perfectly. If he stuck around, he stuck around for another kid. That kid is, seems damaged. I don't know. I don't know him, but you know, yeah. I lucked out. So, yeah. uh, yeah, you get, but the, your first like 10 minutes of stand up is like, well, what's makes, what's makes my point of view and what are my, so-called like issues or weird things because they would say they write about your family but nowadays like who the hell comes from a nuclear family you yeah. know i mean it's, it's so rare you have that great joke about like why you adopted yeah you know and you're like because it's genetically my balls are poison i'm, I'm paraphrasing <laughs> yeah. but uh you know it, it i just think no one and now it just makes stand-up kind of more interesting because look it's cool when people have just a, my dad does this joke but so many people have these unique stories now and so many people have what happened to me is so common. I mean, uh, so yeah, I met him late in life. He left a note in a safety deposit box. That was like two paragraphs. You could have given me two pages, but it was like, like a, it was like a couple deposit paragraphs. Box? Was... Yeah. In the bank. He was he like, spy? He was... I know it was like very dramatic. <laughs> is I was your like, father I to go... Ripley? <laughs> I wish Ripley was interesting. Uh, Ripley, uh, your father, guy, Richard Greenleaf. <laughs> I just that was on TV the other day. That's a great, oh my God, great book and movie. I, I love, so good, I love yeah. Ripley. Have yeah. you seen the show? I haven't. It's a good, I've show. Heard it's good. Is unreal. It's worth really? the investment. It's worth the investment. I just, I just watched the uh, Vim Vendors one too. The American Friend. Yep. Uh, the show Ripley but, is Chef's Kiss. Okay, I'm gonna check it out. Yeah. I, I love thrillers like that. I love. She's a great writer, Patricia Highsmith. I love yeah, her yeah, stuff. Yeah. Uh, so, but uh, as we say, one of our best chick writers. <laughs> Strangers <laughs> on a Train, pretty pretty. Oh, good, she's good, yeah. good book movie combo too. Both so are, great. The movies. So, it's it's rare when they're both awesome. But and I uh, yeah, I'm at the point now where like I love horror and science fiction. Like those are the, my go tos. But I actually prefer. I like plots. I like to have to figure something out. Um, yeah. I don't get, and I never was into, I'm not as into slasher films as much as people assume I am. It's just, to me, it's just gore porn. It's just like, yeah. And like snore, you know, like, but I get, there's a sport to it um, about the clever ways to kill people. Um, it's funny. My middle daughter, Alice, was never into horror movies, went to college and became a horror movie fan in college. Uh, we came, she came back for break and we went to see Thanksgiving, uh, the Eli Roth film. And we're walking Tim out. Tim Dillon is in that, right? Yes. Yes, he is. Yes, he is. <laughs> yeah. He also lives right up the street. Um, yep. But uh, we walk out of the movie and she goes, okay, dad, what were your favorite kills? <laughs> but that's like yeah that's how they rate it now but i'm more like a patricia highsmith fan like i want to find out Same. what's really happening and why and uh you know i love and, the psychological ones i'm yeah. with you and having being in the middle of writing one now what's interesting is that you have to write them backwards you have to engineer so you, know, you have you to know, know you know what can end. end yeah and then you've got to backwards engineer it so it's it's fun it's like building a crossword puzzle interesting yeah i mean yeah. those are like my favorite types of movies yeah for i sure. love those um but anyway your dad left a your dad left a your biological father he left, left a, a note, note in your in a safety, in a safety deposit, deposit box. box 
and I and I asked my mom, I was like, yeah, well, so what's the deal with him, kind of? And uh, it was weird. My family didn't really talk about stuff. For Jews, they had definitely a waspy side where it was all just like very much like we don't talk about anything. Right. Uh, so... Uh, what yeah, is the I, difference? I, what is an Ashkenazi Jew? What what is the what is the thing there? Yeah, probably my eyebrows. You oh, know, okay. uh, <laughs> Eastern all, European. It all comes down you know? to eyebrows. Just I I mean, it really. I, I turn on the Olympics, and every dude on Croatia just looks like me. You know, it's just it's like oh god, it's, it's half Jokic the, and just, half the yeah. women, <laughs> and half the women. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and I think. Uh, yeah, we're just Eastern European Jews, but uh, okay. and then you have the uh, Sephardic Jews that are more like Egyptian, and right. Uh, okay, but yeah. Uh, so I I got the note and I read it and it was pretty unsatisfying. It wasn't like it just. I, his story is is I feel for him too. I mean he he didn't handle anything well, but he had just lost a wife to cancer and uh, had another kid and wasn't ready for a kid. Mm-hmm. Uh, which said that I say, don't raw dog, dude. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I we all like fucking without a condom. You gotta, <laughs> you gotta be cautious. Yeah, uh, you know. But uh, he, I talked to him a bit. He, he is kind of a narcissist, so he's kind of hard to have a real relationship with. But I do think I do. Whenever people, I've had people reach out to me, like you know, people who just like my comedy and be like, oh, I have a similar situation. I don't know whether to meet him. And I say, or you know. I was gonna say or her. It's usually the dad that leaves, though. Sure, but they're, they're occasional. I think Jermaine Fowler's mom left. He's a, he's a comic. Uh, yeah, and then nine so times it, out of ten, nine times out of ten, that situation can be traced to drugs. Not in my situation, and also yeah. it is no. I mean, when the, your mom leaves you, because I usually oh uh, yeah, because it's such a fundamental bond, there would have to be something overwhelming. You know, like that would have to it's be true. like bone deep addiction that would that would fry out that level of your the biological imperative and it's also just harder to i mean the baby's inside you it's a lot of times they leave all the babies in her it's like so you got you got <laughs> yeah. you got a built-in head start you know <laughs> but uh you know you're she, like a dog that peed on the couch you're like no i, I, I <laughs> uh, this is my place yeah <laughs> he, uh, he was you know He's kind of just like a bullshitter, I think. He's he's not a bad dude. He's just some of those guys are just yeah. bad dads. They're just, you know. Yeah. But he but he just uh I think he does regret it, which is something. You it would it would suck if you show up and he's like, Yeah, I nailed it. I made the right choice. Yeah, best thing you know, I ever I did. <laughs> best but boy I ever think, made. Uh, but you know, my mom gave me insight. But good for you. But 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 good for you in the sense that as you say you know, you're, you're, however you got to where you ended up, your dad's great. My dad's awesome. And he's yeah, like and very, very supportive and so smart and, uh, very, uh, it's, he's the opposite. He's like, family is everything. Yeah, like he and, really, that's how he, he like, and there's always when you have a blended family going to be weird shit going on where you just don't feel, you know, it was kind of just like, Oh, this is your family now. That's not natural. Obviously, mm-hmm. you know, that's not how life works. But uh, he would he would go out of his way to make us all do things as a family to make it like very much that we were a family. So right, because you were seven I, or five when you met him. I would. I don't know. He got married when I was six or seven. Yeah, so you're I very think. young. Like your 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 memories of him not being your dad are not that prevalent or strong. Like he was always kind yeah. of there. Oh my God, my name would have been Sam Greenberg if they never met. Can you imagine my ticket sales in the Midwest? They would have been <laughs> terrible. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> but Morel, there's some fucking ambiguity. You would have changed there. That's, your that's name to please welcome Sam Whiteman. <laughs> He's a a really good dude, and the, yeah, my biological dad. Like my mom told me stories already. Like she couldn't be a hundred percent unbiased. So I was hearing stories of like. uh did he just she di- saw ditch? Us. Like, like, good no, luck, my, kid. My, no, my, I was not born yet. He just left. So, but that's uh, what I mean. My, like, like to your mom, like, hope you have some money. Yeah, I, I think he just said, I can't do this. Yeah, yeah. and then, uh, well, you can yeah. pay for it. You can pay for it, though. <laughs> no, no, he didn't. He didn't. <laughs> yeah, do that. that's that's the like. Eh. 
But he, uh, my friend Damian Lemon also is a hilarious joke where he's like, I had the type of dad that left the family but stayed in the neighborhood. And I was like, that was kind of the same shit that he did to us. <laughs> where he he stayed. That is the definition of adding insult to injury. That it really is. The is. <laughs> he's down like, the block. That's, that's the photo in the encyclopedia. <laughs> well, so I would see him on the street. It was so weird. I would see, uh, once I had met him, I would just see him. He lived, he is like the ultimate kind of scam artist. He lives in artist housing. He's not an artist. He worked in advertising, but his wife was like, you know, worked on Broadway for a while. So they got it. His wife is very nice. His wife's uh-huh. a very nice person. Uh, and his wife is why I met Lily Tomlin. His wife did hair for Lily Tomlin. Oh, for well, and years. she's, and Lily's amazing. I'm a huge fan of hers. I was yeah, a huge fan astounding. of her growing. I mean, Search for Signs of Intelligent Life was like brilliant. Nashville's yeah. one of my favorite movies. That search ever. is getting harder and harder, by the way. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so I got I got to hang out with her a couple of times. I was like, holy shit, she's so cool. But, yeah, she's uh, lovely. But then, uh, uh, yeah, it, it was just hard to maintain a relationship. You know how busy we get. And like, I, I was hard to make time for even the closest people in your life. So it gets harder, you know, it just, yeah. it gets harder. And, and it was, I think it's more, you do it to find out where you can. It's almost like taking a 23 and me. You're like, Oh cool. Now I know where I came from. Right. I'm like, maybe you could hit me with some medical history. I'm like, cool. Prostate <laughs> cancer. Of course. <laughs> he's, he's like 90 and alive. He's right. pushing 90. He's yeah. That's super, a, I have that with my dad. He's 93 and still and crushing. He's drinking and he's driving. Grand Torino. I yeah, met that's your dad. Grand he's Torino. fucking awesome. Yeah, yeah. He, he called me the other day. Oh, that's right. You met my dad at the wedding. Yeah, so, he was. I loved him. Your family's awesome. They're pretty. Your, bro- they're, your brothers are hilarious too. They're all hilarious. The ones you met are all hilarious. There's a couple yeah. you didn't meet, but my father called me the other day, re- referencing Bobcat Goldthwait. My father calls me up, hammered, ninety three, hammered. Hey, damn. What what's going on there with your friend? Who are you talking about? The one you, the, the, who I met, the one you work with. What's his name? Woodchuck. <laughs> oh, Bobcat. Yeah, but, him. What did I say? And like now, Bobcat is Woodchuck. Woodchuck. <laughs> I said, Woodchuck. What are you doing? <laughs> I love. By the way, I don't want to know what a ninety-three-year-old hangover feels like because it's it's hurting me now. I I can't imagine. I don't know. I was my hungover been... yesterday, and I was like, kill. Me. I'm gonna die. Yeah. I, um, here's some weird thing. My da- I mean, my dad started drinking at 16, 17, so I don't even know if he's been hung. I don't, I think his body is just like, uh, that's what is like, he had a stroke and his oh, doctor man. said like, don't stop doing what you're doing. It's like, at this point, if my dad stopped drinking, the shock I think would instantly kill him. <laughs> um, I know you mean. Uh, yeah. But so. Um, but your dad, you know, those by your know, dad's pushing 90, which is, which is great. Crazy. It is. I don't f- think he's doing well. He, he had a depressive breakdown though. I don't think he's doing well. I mean, he, I think his life hit him in a way that he couldn't, uh, he couldn't handle. And he had like a breakdown and he kind of became nonverbal for a while. He wasn't speaking. Uh-huh. It was weird. But I also was like, it's hard for me to feel pity. I was just kind of like, stop being such a pussy and speak. <laughs> that was kind of how I looked at him. I'm like, you what? Oh, was this while you met him? Yeah. No, after I met him, he was all right for a while. And then I was kind of like told him, I was like, and then I think he had other stuff from his childhood that was trauma. He had trauma from his childhood that he finally dealt with. But I was kind of like, dude, you, I have a hard time. I mean, the irony is not lost to me that like, oh, so now I'm supposed to take care of him. It's crazy. Yeah. Right. Oh my God. Yeah. So I just, uh, it was very hard to be around and uh I liked his wife, but they were having marital stuff too. That was and they would kind of like talk to me. I'm like, I don't want to fucking like you you chose this dude. Yeah, I didn't yeah, choose yeah, yeah, yeah. We broke up. <laughs> but it, he, he was a I'm not gonna go to your high school reunion with you. We broke up. <laughs> he uh I th- I think he's he's tough to, to uh to be with. So I'm I, I lucked out, as I said. I did I, you- I did joke. Oh, sorry. What were you saying? No, no. Go ahead. You had a joke. Oh, I had a joke that never worked on stage. Is the thing I, I was talking about. Like you have sometimes those jokes where like the crowd likes you so, uh, too much to laugh. Like you earned enough credibility in the set where they don't want to laugh at what they think 
maybe they associate is with his being pain. But to me, it was like, oh, it's just self-deprecating. But I have a darker sense yeah. of humor about it because it is me. I think it's funny. So uh, the joke was like, you said the word adopted before. And uh, I mean, it's like, it doesn't sound right. So, you know, but what happens when your stepdad wants to adopt you, they have to get the biological dad to sign a piece of paper. So I would say it's like the opposite of a UPS package. He's like, here's my signature and uh, I don't want this. Never w- would not hit. They were just like, oh. no, I understand. I'm like, no. I know. But to me, but to me, I'm like, that's a good dark joke. But they thought it was like, they felt bad for me. And I remember I, I was in therapy at the time. And I mentioned to my therapist and he was like, they like you. They like you. So they feel bad for you. I'm like, I know, but I guess, but, that, but that's what it, exactly it. It's not, the stage is not a place for healing. The stage is a place for entertainment. Yeah. So yeah. that's and why I, it didn't work. No, I, I get that completely. My current, I currently open with this. Uh, I just shot a special, which means I have no material because I burned an hour. Uh, but I didn't panic because I thought stuff will happen to me. Yeah. I'll talk about it and that will be my new material. And then four days later, my mother died. And I thought, I don't need new material that badly. <laughs> That's great. That's a what great if joke. my car died? <laughs> and but people like don't want to laugh it's like no if i'm making this joke i'm okay with it you know it's like, right right you know. that's a gr- that's that's a great joke yeah that's because it's just so the turn is so good i mean it, well, people it's, aren't I expecting think, that out of the gate and you know it's so yeah. funny i did that at the melrose improv saturday last saturday or whatever and there was a bachelorette party on the side of the stage and i ended up having to sit at their table with the microphone doing my set from their table is the only way to get them to not talk. And they still talked. (laughs) Oh my God. After all this time, you still, there's no dignity. It's like, you still go, nope. You still got to deal with bachelorette parties. You still got to deal with comics. (laughs) That's why comics stay cool. That's why comedians, I think, end up staying pretty cool because you just end up getting humbled too much in this business. Like anytime I see a comic that has a, like a crazy ego, I'm just thinking you're not aware. You have no awareness because there's no way you don't deal with this shit. It's the people that get off stage and are like, I fucking, I killed it. And I'm like, no, you suck. And then (laughs) you see the comic who's like miserable and aware and feeling everything. That's why like the most sensitive comics are like, they feel every, and you're like, Oh, I feel bad for that guy. Because we all have to feel it, you yeah, know? Yeah, 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 But But those ones who, like, oh, my God, man. Like, I, I did years of, like, and I know you did, too, those years of just, like, bad Ugh. rooms where you're like, Ugh. oh, I'm just, like, I'm just, I got worse at comedy for a period because I was just, sure. like, I was, like, a rabid dog <laughs> where, like, I was just attacking them before they, even oh. though I have a nice crowd, I'd be like, fuck you. And they'd be like, what the hell? I'm like, sorry. It's like, you know. The, the late, great Kevin Rooney. Uh, who I, I, you know, this word is so sweaty, but, uh, like, uh, he, he, I hate the word mentor, but like, uh, he was the Obi-Wan Kenobi to my Luke Skywalker when I was coming up. Like he had definitely like, I never had to audition at the improv. Uh, Kevin brought me down to the improv one night, said to Bud Friedman, Hey bud, this is my friend, Dana Gould. He's really funny. Bud said, call in for spots. That was it. Wow. Yeah. That's, no, that's I mean, awesome. his word was meant a lot. And and he said to me, I was middling for him, and he said, uh, best advice I've ever gotten in comedy, because I was a rabid dog, just like you. And he said, uh, you know, the audience wants to like you, but first they they want to make sure that you like them. And I was a better comic the next show. You get so obsessed with like the purity of joke writing that you forget that this is entertainment and you have to actually be likable. I mean, we yeah, all know it's a comic a, again who's like, to quote Kevin Rooney. It's a show. It's a show. You're in and, a light. And, they paid to come in. It's yeah. a show. Yeah, I mean, I, we all know that guy who's so likable off stage. And then he goes up there and immediately is like. There was a guy who's open for me and he was so funny, man, but he would just turn on the crowd every time. I couldn't use yeah. him because 
he re- and I would tell him like, dude, you're so charming off stage and you're so funny. And even your jokes are good, but like you're in, you're like, he's like in tag. He's like going at people like, fuck. and he's not an insult comic. He's just like, fuck you. And then I go yeah. on like, all right, time to tell some yeah. jokes, I guess. No, yeah, I no, know. It's, it's, it's tough. I know. And, and I've been know, that guy. I've been that dude too. So well, I get we all, it. Yeah. As I've said, no one goes into stand up. No one ever, no one has ever said, well, now that I've worked out all my emotional shit, I'm going <laughs> to go into bars and beg strangers to love me. I mean, <laughs> you know, there's always that comic that's on stage in front of 2000 people. One guy's not laughing and that's all you can do is glare at that. It turns out he doesn't speak English, but he's just like, you yeah. motherfucker. Um, you know, I know Baron had that, he had that great bit about that, about how he just fucking hated that biker guy in the front row. He's like, I hate this guy. I hate that guy. And then he went up to him after the show, like, Oh, uh, what do you think of the show? And the guy's like, you were great, man. And he's like, so that means that guy lives in my head. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But I, but I, I was in the cellar the other night and there was, I was killing, I was like, I had, had a couple of rough ones in a row and like, I needed this. I do the new stuff. Finally is coming together. I yeah. needed this one and I was killing. And there were these two women in the front who just hate me and i joked about it i was like man you guys are really taking this win away from me because you look miserable and i got off stage and i was like geez i mean that was weird i i, I turned the corner from the my the other spot i do i come back around i walk into them and they go oh it's him and i was like holy shit now you're ruining their life I'm like I, I'm like I, I didn't want to run into you either, you know. Shit. <laughs> Did you say that? <laughs> no, I just laughed and I kept going. But you know, <laughs> it's so weird. Yeah, it's 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 well, that it brings to mind a question. You know, it's it's rejection, and like you know, show business is a is a business of rejection. Like it's 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 yeah. mo- it's show business. I you know from my point of view, like as a person that goes from comedy you know, the acting, it's auditioning or writing, it's pitching. It's all about how many no's can you, how many no's will your psyche allow you to take? Can you, can you withstand the blizzard of no's until you get hit with a yes? Cause yeah, you know, it's one out of every two dozen times you get a yes and you've just got to be able to plow through the no's and not take it personally. Uh, yeah. cause it isn't personal. Um, do you, did you find it? I, I asking this question, I don't genuinely know the answer. Uh, did you ever deal with, because of your biological father, like this innate core of rejection? Like what, why the fuck? And there's, and then I'm going to tell you something my daughter said to me. It was interesting. I don't know if why, but I, I, if that's why, but I, absolutely have a chip on my shoulder like i i definitely felt like uh i think everyone takes rejection no one's like oh cool rejection but i definitely would feel like oh fuck you for not thinking i'm good but then i think i'm bad half the time so it's that weird feeling of like hey fuck you but then i'm also like well i don't like me that much i'm just it's like when people it's like when people will shit on Jews who are Jews, and I'm just like, yeah, we can be annoying. But then when it's a non-Jew, I'm like, hey, fuck you, dude. We're yeah, cool. Exactly. You know? Yeah, exactly. It's the well, same. It's, like, it's all the same shit. Yeah. Uh, Someone described this uh, uh, in a in a recovery meeting, but it also applies to all comedians. It's like a we're the piece of shit the sun revolves around. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> <You know? laughs> it's so true. Oh, I, we're the worst. I mean, I've always said the comedians the we're only time they ask the center of the universe. The only time comedians ask what other people is when they're doing crowd work. We're the most self. <laughs> we're the most self obsessed people on the planet. We're insufferable. But but then also like, <laughs> I love my comedy friends, man. I really yeah, do. Sure. Like I I know I know that I'm the most insufferable in my family. I know that. Like I, I know that I'm annoying. But you know, comedians. Yeah. We are annoying people. It's just, uh, yeah. it's, it's just, is what it is. But I used to say I'm, I'm bidding on a rare, rare photograph of a comedian listening to someone. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> We're the worst. <laughs> My friend Gary always tells me he's like the only time you listen to me is when we're recording my podcast. <laughs> you see me in a conversation, and you see me outside of the house. Yeah. My inner monologue is ask them about themselves, ask them about themselves, ask them about yes. themselves. Yeah, it's just and I 
it, it, we're, it, we're the worst. Because, but our job is all about, that's why people, that's why comedians don't automatically make good actors because comedy is about talking and acting is about listening. They're actually completely the opposite. Um, I and that's why and that's why actors make bad talk show guests because they're vessels, right? I mean, yeah, that's why I this suck at auditions. I'm the worst. I'm a terrible at auditions. I think twice I've gotten jobs off auditions out of the thousands of auditions because somebody who's reading you for an audition is not acting. They're like, "Oh my, my god, Lord. you're stabbing me in the head. Why are you stabbing me in the head? I thought I was your friend." You know, that's a good and point. I can't give you anything. Because, you know, a skilled actor or a skilled auditioner, it's a, it's, you know, auditioning is a, auditioning is a craft, uh, uh, will, will know how to manufacture that. But if I'm in a scene with a good actor, I can lock into that actor and I can give it as, give it back, you know? Um, yeah. uh, but it's tricky, but, uh, we all have that chip. I was talking to my daughter who, uh, you know, because my kids are adopted and they don't know their biological parents. They, uh, they're from China and there's no, we don't know. Um, and I was talking to my daughter about it. And, uh, I said, uh, you know, if I, I, I don't know anything, but I'll tell you every, if you ever want to talk about it, I'll tell you everything I know. We have all the paperwork. I know all, you know, and my daughter said, yeah, I got to be honest with you. I didn't really think about it. I mean, you've already ruined me. What am I going to do? Meet some old Chinese guy that's going to unruin me? Don't think so. Your kids are funny, man. I <laughs> mean, kids are funny, but it's I, like I can I, see but from I your... Get, I get the urge to know, but yeah, yeah. it's not, it's not going to provide... I think my mom was really worried when I met him because I think she thought I thought it was going to provide some sort of closure, but she... yeah. Obviously had a pretty unbiased opinion on him already. And when we were, uh, when I was a baby, she was pushing me in the stroller in the streets in New York and he still lived here. And she ran into him on the street when I was a baby pushing me. And she goes, this is Sam, your son. And he just went, looks like you and kept walking. And uh, so th th that shit. was in her mind. Yeah, that was her mind of like what you're dealing with. <laughs> so uh, what? she went what? in being like, uh, dude you buried the lead that yeah, happened yeah 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 how old so, were you i was a, i mean i don't remember it i was a baby she told it to me but oh my god uh so i think he was a little bit of a cock yeah well that i mean that uh Wow. You know, the, it's funny. I'll, what, when I became a dad, it was the, the relief that I felt, the huge weight off of my chest was my life is no longer about me, mm -hmm. which I took as a tremendous relief. Like if my kids are cared for, happy, healthy, fed, clothed, housed, loved, I am a successful person to, to be in your biological father's position in that instance. It's like, Oh no, you failed. You had one thing to do provide for this thing, this person, and you botched it. Um, yeah. so yeah, that's, that is a but crazy. And you yeah, read I these think stories like screaming Jay Hawkins had like 16 kids. <laughs> like he didn't, like he didn't. When I hear about people didn't give like anybody that, a dime, you know, it's like all these insane. Really should have been, been, been called fucking Jay Hawkins. <laughs> I, I think exactly. I, I think, dude, when I was on the road as a young comic, even then it was in my ingrained in my head, like wear a condom. You don't sure. want to be the, because that was always the fear. Like you will become this dude. You will become. Yeah. Hundred uh, percent. So I, I I was so I had friends who were like, oh, I raw dogged this uh, audience member after my show, and I was like, first off, even if I didn't have the issues I have, probably not the smartest idea. 
But uh, look, we all make mistakes. I might have slipped up a couple of times, but I was interesting good choice of words. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, dude, it was uh, it was in my head all the time, and oh. I and 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 to just not. We all have that moment where you're like, "Oh my god, I'm turning in this guy." But the weird thing is when you meet him, and he's the only guy. My uncle looks like me, but he looks a lot like my mom's brother. But he looks that my biological dad looks a lot like me. So it it is weird being like, "Oh, we look exactly alike. We have a lot of the same mannerisms." Uh, you know, it, it, there's a lot of stuff that is biological, but. You get the actual nature nurture thing because he did raise a kid and right. and then he then raised the other kids. So, yeah. uh, but I know that I know I've met his other side of his family a little bit and they're, they're, they're nice. I mean, I don't know him well, but how was you your, bi- how was your father when you were going to go and meet your biological father? So secure. Yeah, um, the kid check it out. I mean, I mean, <laughs> like he was just like he was kind of like he was like I think you should do it. I think he's basically him just flexing, like, yeah, go see this fucking loser after I provided for you and has been have been an awesome dad and take you to Knicks games and uh, you know, like I think he was kind of like enjoy. I think he knew what I was in for. <laughs> have at it. <laughs> Yeah. No, yes. he was he was incredibly secure about it and uh and I think my mom was worried because my mom is a worrier. That's yeah. that's her that her she's in a constant state of just anxiety and worry and uh, and I don't worry enough. She is, is a problem. Jewish she is a Jewish mom. She's a, she's a Jew. <laughs> but I don't I really don't worry enough and that's you know I I I kind of just act now and think later. I I very much like I go on the road, I do my thing. I kind of, you know, there's so many years on the road where you're just like, oh, just keep your head down and hopefully it's better in like a year. And then and, and, and <laughs> a year after that, you're like, just keep your head to keep doing this. So yeah, I you tried just that. Keep if I slam it away at it. If I lived too much in the moment, I would have gone crazy. I had to just be like, fuck it. I'll have a drink after the show. I'll chill out. I'll watch a movie in my room. Like I had to just think, let me... As much as we're in our head, we need. To, I do need that moment to shut down at the end of the night and read or watch a movie or uh, yeah. or do something that's not that's not this or you know no. to drink also. Well, yeah, that's why I love. Yeah. I never got into weed. I never got into drugs that yeah. like that raise thoughts. I like drugs that like just shut it down. Yeah, well, and it's also you if you don't do anything outside of your act, your act is about your act. I mean, you have to have a life go on stage you know you have to right you know it's uh stephen king said uh your life is not a support system for your art your art is a support system for your life well you know it's not about your art it's about your life you know uh and and that's really that's really that's really true uh i wonder if he's a happy guy stephen king yeah i think he's really happy you know, it is funny how he's, I mean, he is like a genetic wonder. Um, like he's, he's like, no, I, I have to write. Like he has to get that out. <laughs> you know, it's so he, cool. And it's he burps, up he he burps yeah. up novels. Just, <laughs> you know, it's like, no, I'll be at the airport and it'll just be like Stephen King. I'm like, again? <laughs> it's crazy. <laughs> but he's just like, I... You know, uh, we, my uh, wife and I just went down to uh, Palm Springs for two days for our anniversary. And uh, I always think, like, if I had no ambition, uh, 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 kids aside, if, uh, kids aside, but let's say my, my other, my youngest goes to college in four years and I'm not going to like it. Um, but uh, if I had like zero ambition, I could just live in Palm Springs. And get up every day, exercise, write for four hours, and then the day's my own. My wife and I can do whatever and do it again the next day. Like, I could do that, but I have this crazy 
ambition that, no, I have to be in New York or LA. I have to be in the center of everything. I need to be doing this. I get to be doing 18 things. Um, you know, and that's why, you know, uh, like Stephen King, he just does that. He wakes up. That's his life. He wakes up. He writes. But doesn't he live in like Maine or something? He lives in Maine and Florida. He splits it. But he he wakes up. He exercises Access. last. He go, he wakes up. He does his writing. He goes for a walk. He watches the ball game. He has dinner. He does revisions before he goes to bed. You know, Every rich like, person splits time in Florida. That's just yeah. what they do. My dad's finally going to Florida. Really? Uh, to for the winter. He to live with my brother. I have one brother who lives in Florida. My dad's going down there to live him with him for the winter just first time he waited till he was 93 to finally go to florida Um, i i don't i don't think i could ever do that but every once in a while i'll be out of florida and i got a road gig and i'm like "Ah, the sun feels kind of good i kind of get the appeal for a minute but yeah i'm 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 never going i'm not a florida guy i'm not either i do love the desert though right at the lip of yucca valley and the mojave desert and it's like living on the moon you know, it's just this lunar landscape right by Joshua Tree National Park. But yeah, I I get it. Like, uh, yeah. you know, and, and you do like in Palm Springs now, like, yes, there was 109. You like nobody goes out from like one to four. It's the town's empty because everybody's just inside. But it's too hot. But, yeah. But I like, I think I could do it. Uh, yeah. I, for some reason, I like the like because I, I don't. My oldest daughter is so much like me. Uh, she doesn't like New York. She's, I'm never comfortable in Manhattan, nor is my oldest. Because uh, I have Manhattan, and I'm sure she's the same way. I have Manhattan between my ears. You know, it gets redundant when I'm there. Um, I need, like, silence. I need a, I need a flat, horizontal plane. <laughs> you know? uh, Don't worry. I'm the, op- I'm the opposite. I love, I love that yeah. there's noise. I like, without noise, I'm kind of like, I feel like I'm in the fucking, what's that new, uh, the Quiet Place movies. I feel like I'm in one of those. <laughs> I, I go crazy, man. The new one was yeah. pretty good. I just watched it. Yeah, no, I hear but, it's great. Uh, I hear it's great. I, I liked it. Uh, no, I but, totally get it. I totally get it. That it's two halves of the same, uh, same coin. So You've Changed is on Amazon Prime. Yeah. Uh, same time tomorrow will be available on your YouTube channel. Yeah, it's Sam on Sam Morell, two in, R's, until, one L. Yeah, it'll be on uh, uh, my YouTube September 1st. It's on Netflix till then. I, I got the rights back, so I did one of those Smart. licensing deals. Yeah, we'll see. I mean, we'll see. It's, maybe we'll give another bump. I, I have another couple on YouTube that are Comedy Central ones, Positive Influence. I got this was already on YouTube, but, uh, right. yeah, it's, it's, it's a cool new age where, where people can just, as you said, you know, back in the day, watch, I, those are my first couple of specials where we like, watch it at 11 PM. And now you can just click a link. It's pretty yeah, cool. Yeah, no, it, it's, it's a very different, uh, it's a different world for sure. Um, uh, and I, I don't know if it matter. I mean, Netflix certainly can launch a career and it launches a career bigger than comedians used to be like Richard Pryor and George Carlin and Steve Martin at their peaks were not selling out the rooms that Burt Kreischer is selling out. Yeah. You know, it's we're, just we're talking, so comedy's the, popular right now. Nothing against Bert, who I really like. <laughs> I know, did his, like, I yeah. did his fully loaded yeah. tours. No, he's it's, a great he's a great guy. It's, it's just like it it's just a, like Bobcat opened for Adam Sandler in, in a room. The last act in that room I did too. I, was I, the I did who. Those, the tour too. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's like eighteen thousand people. I didn't even know how you do comedy for that crazy many people. Fun. Well, he does music in his act and he does a screen too. So it's like, it is more, it feels like more of an arena act than like just pure. pure what just were you, how did you do it? Jokes. Uh, I did like 10, 12 minutes up top and they were, they were a good crowd. They're, yeah. they're comedy fans. So I, but yeah, the laughs great. come like 10 seconds later. Yeah. I've been lucky enough. I did a, a few arenas before I, I did like when Amy Schumer did train wreck and, and all that stuff, I was, I was doing arenas with her. Uh, and it was, 
it was crazy. It was uh, some of the best sets of my life, honestly. Oh, great. So crowd, the crowd was so red hot. So for the first couple of jokes, they're like, prove it. And then after you get, mm-hmm. I had a couple big, she produced a special of mine based on a joke I did opening for her when I was like, when I needed, I really needed help. You know, right. and she, I had a joke in the arena that crushed where I was like, you women are amazing because you can fake an orgasm, but not a good mood. And it just fucking <laughs> applause break. And she's like, I got, I want to make your special. I was like, well, holy shit. I think we're in like the Wells Fargo arena. You're right. walking out. You're like, this is where the Philadelphia 76ers yeah, exactly. Play. Yeah. That's what I mean. It's this like, is crazy. Yeah. And like Richard Pryor I don't, never did that. I don't that. have ambitions for that. I, I love comedy in clubs. I love it in theaters. I, yeah. I, I like the intimacy. There's certain theaters that are big that you still feel like Chicago theater is one of the bigger theaters I played. That's like 3,600 people, but it actually feels kind of intimate. There's a few that you actually, you can see people. I was right. doing crowd work in that theater at the end. I was fucking with people after right. I did my hour. And then, uh, but then for the most part, I think something's lost after you get something is je- like you play the hits fine. You kill, but like, I think overall something is is lost after like 2000 usually. I agree. I agree, but you know, and and it's funny and I I know you're the same way. Whatever room you're in, whether you're at the cellar or the you know, Wells Fargo Arena, the thing is you're working on a new bit, it's starting to come together and you can feel it come together and you can feel that laugh getting stronger and more reliable. That's what it's all about. It's like, ah, I created this thing. I, I you know, it, that's. That's the only way you feel good really after is like uh, so much of my self-esteem hinges on like, did the new thing work? Did yeah. I get a new line? You yeah. know? And that's the, you know, that's why, like I never understand these comedians and they're out there. Like they get an hour and they just do it for 40 years. It's like hell gigs. They're probably they're probably surviving off hell gigs. A yeah, lot of them, but it's also like, don't you? Then why go on stage if you're not doing anything? If you're not creating anything, Rent. I don't understand why you go on. Yeah, sure. <laughs> I, think, yeah. I think some guys get caught in a in a cycle where they're just getting booked based on the fact that they kill, and then when they stop killing, yeah. they're like, "Fuck my life." You know, I I think it's tough, man. I, I yeah, but I but I'm with you. Like I would be I'd be going crazy. Yeah. I'd, I'd be miserable. I, there's nothing worse when you see a waitress mouthing a comics act. That is like to me the kiss of death. Where you got to write new shit. Yeah, it's but it's the whole point. It's like having one. So you've changed Amazon Prime. Uh, same. Same time tomorrow is same time on tomorrow YouTube. is on your YouTube channel September first. Sam yeah. Morel, two R's one L. Are you developing yeah. another? You know, like what are your managers telling you? You got to come up with a show. You got to come up with a movie. No, no. I, You're I think the host I, of I a my, game show. I think my my agent is happy to keep me on the road right now. But mm-hmm. I, I mean, I'd like to make a show. I love writing. I love writing a show with you. I'm writing a show with Mike Lawrence. So we'll see if that goes oh, anywhere. I love Mike Lawrence. He loves you, yeah. Oh he's, yeah, tell him I said, hey, he's the best. Yeah, he's he's the man, and uh, so we're, we're making. Is he a out show here too, or is he in New York? New York, uh, L.A. But, yeah, so you're doing the same thing. Uh, but we'll, yeah, we'll see what happens, and then. Uh, but I'm also like, you know, I for me, I just like writing, and I like. I mean, I learned so much working with you. I mean, the way you write, and as you know, and it's the same with stand up. It's not writing; it's rewriting. You just got to re- push. It everything. really is. It yeah, really the analogy is. Dude. About sandcastles. It's like, yeah, it looks like shit, but once I get it, once I make it into a mountain, then I can make it into a castle, but I got to make it into a pile of shit first. You know, in our show, we, we, it was so funny first. It was so punchline heavy and fun characters. And like, that's all I really want to make is like, I feel like they, they don't make enough of those shows anymore. So, but I do think there's going to be a swing back and a need for that. I do too. And you know, the, the, the country is culturally. Um, you know, it's reflected in the politics and we don't know what's going to happen with the politics, but, you know, culturally, I do feel that people are kind of shaking off the pandemic and, you know, I, I think that people, uh, there's a, there's a, the desire for lightness. I mean, I've been writing on the show, Ted, which is all about, I love it. Being dude. Funny. I love yeah. that show. And I, that cri- that Christmas episode was perfect. Oh, the, the truck. <laughs> oh my God. It was perfect. <laughs> yeah. it, I mean, it's just a. It's the just the type shot of show we I needed. We got to do was as the truck was driving to 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 Provincetown. We were going to have it run over and crushed by another truck. <laughs> we took it out. But yeah, no, it's all about being funny. And and you know, Seth is 
is so sharp yeah. and he so knows what What's, I'm a fan, dude. Yeah, he's he's awesome. He's, he's really, so great, I, and uh, and yeah, that show's just fun. That that show's just like hard three hard jokes a page. Like boom, it's so fun. Yeah, it's just perfect. The kid is so perfect as a so young good. Wahlberg. He yeah. just, I mean, everyone. I mean, look, everyone's perfect on it. But like that, I was like, oh my god, that's a hard casting to do for a kid, and they just nailed it. Yeah, I wanted them to be. I said we should cast a fat kid. Like I can totally see, like, like did you ever see Bad Santa? I love Bad Santa. Yeah, ba- like yeah. the kid from Bad Santa. Like I can absolutely see that kid at seventeen deciding to become Mark Wahlberg. Like that's true. <laughs> you know, like <laughs> that was an, that was another just underrated. Yeah, just but, I mean, just, hilarious, hilarious. And just, but had but has just the right amount of a heart at the end. We were yeah. like, oh. I, it gets you in the end where he gets that dumb little toy for the kid. Yeah, I loved it. What's this? A wooden pickle. <laughs> I loved it. Hey. Uh, well, Sam Morrell, two R's, one L. Uh, look for his yeah, YouTube man. channel and his stuff on Amazon Prime. Bodega Cat Whiskey? Is that nationally yeah, available? Yeah. Did I send you a bottle of that or no? No, we never even talked about it. My wife is oh a whiskey God. expert, and I we didn't send, even talk gonna, to you I'm on a whiskey you a company. Bottle. Well, I'm gonna um, send you a bottle. I'll I let thought I sent you a bottle. It. Maybe it's good. It's pretty good. I love it. We are about to witness the takeoff of the first manned rocket to outer space. We pick up the count: seven, six, five, four, three, two, one, zero. We're off to visit the planets. There are treats galore in the stars. Venus is loaded with candy. And ice cream is found upon Mars. The soda pumps isn't on Saturn. When you're thirsty, it sure is the spot. And Jupiter's really jumping. The pop on this buttered and hot. Yes, sir. Uh, may I help you? Oh, uh, I'd like two of those, please. Hot dogs? Yes, sir. And three of those. And one of those. And five bars of these. And a cup of that nice hot liquid. Uh, coffee. Uh, coming right up. Oh, and two bags of those peculiar white puffy material. Uh, you mean our crunchy popcorn. Uh, uh, shall I wrap that for you, sir? Oh, that's all right. My saucer's just outside. <laughs> they come from miles to enjoy our intermission. They're true tales from Weirdsville. Tales from Weirdsville. And they're true. Can your heart stand? The shocking facts. June 24th, 1947. Kenneth Arnold was on his way to an air show in Yakima, Washington. He was an experienced pilot and a member of an air search and rescue unit. Recently, a U.S. Marine Corps commando transport had crashed in the area with 32 U.S. Marines on board. And Arnold, flying in an aircraft himself, was closely scanning the ground for any signs of the down plane. Around 3 p.m., while flying near Mount Rainier, he was blinded when the sun glinted off a shiny, reflective surface flying above him. At first, he assumed it was the Douglas DC-4 airliner that he knew was in the area. But he ruled that out when the reflective flashes continued, so he banked to get a closer look. Arnold reported seeing nine shiny objects flying in a diagonal line, what pilots call echelon formation, at a rate that he calculated to be approximately 1,200 miles an hour, which was twice as fast as the fastest recorded aircraft at that time. The objects were circular, about 100 feet across, with no tail. Later, Arnold told his story to reporters Bill Baguette and Nolan Skiff of the East Oregonian newspaper. And when that story hit the wires, it spread like wildfire all over the country, with many newspapers following the Chicago Sun's lead 
when it abbreviated Arnold's description of nine bright saucer-like objects to the headline, Supersonic Flying Saucers, Sighted by Idaho Pilot. And that was the birth of the expression, Flying Saucers. Well, the expression, anyway. The phenomena goes back to, in one capacity or other, the beginning of recorded time. Every major religion has stories of celestial visitation of one form or another. Catholicism, Judaism, Buddhism, Hinduism all boast tales of aerial phenomena and contact events. To paraphrase an old saying, one person's angel is another person's alien. But you have to pick one. Or do you? Popular Mechanics of all magazines, has reported of ancient woodcuts that depict celestial phenomena over Nuremberg, Germany in the 1500s. What were they? We don't know! In 1908, near the Podkamenaya Tunguska River in Russia, there was an explosion. But not just any explosion. An explosion with a power somewhere between 3 and 50 megatons. It flattened approximately 80 million trees over an 830 square mile radius. Scientists today believe the explosion was caused by an asteroid exploding somewhere in the atmosphere. That said, the asteroid in question would have had to have been 60 to 200 feet in diameter to create such a blast. Was it an asteroid or a giant flying saucer? As I said, I don't know. However, it was the period immediately following World War II, the late 40s and early 50s, an era of acute anxiety and paranoia that flying saucer mania gripped the world. Following the national coverage of Kenneth Andrews sighting, UFO sightings became a daily occurrence in the United States. Within weeks of the reporting of Kenneth Andrews' story, with UFOs on the national mind, a rancher named W.W. Mac Brazel discovered mysterious wreckage on his ranch in New Mexico. Now, this was 1947. There was no internet or nationally televised newscasts. It was easy not to be in the know, and Brazel was unaware of the national flying saucer craze. He reported the debris, which consisted of some rubber bands, thin sticks, thick weird paper, and tin foil, to George Wilcox, the sheriff of Corona, New Mexico. And Wilcox then contacted the nearby Roswell Army Airfield, they requested to view the wreckage. The following day, the Roswell Army Airfield issued a statement, and I quote, The many rumors regarding the flying disc became a reality yesterday when the intelligence office of the 509th Bomb Group of the 8th Air Force, Roswell Army Airfield, was fortunate enough to gain possession of a disc through the cooperation of one of the local ranchers and the sheriff's office of Chavez County. What? The following day, the Roswell Daily Record ran a story about the crash, including a photo of Major Jesse Marcel, an Army intelligence officer stationed at the base, posing alongside the recovered material. The story was accompanied by another statement by the Army, a statement that suspiciously completely contradicted their statement of the previous day. Now, this blatant switch reeked of a cover-up and fueled conspiracy theories for decades. In the Army's ham-handed attempt to divert attention from the crash, whatever it was, it inadvertently assured the public's attention would never, ever wander. A lot of these UFO conspiracies came to center around a classified military base located on a dry lake bed a little under 100 miles north of Las Vegas, a base that came to be known as Area 51. Area 51 is located conveniently between the Nevada test site 
where nuclear weapons are tested, and the Nevada Test and Training Range. You try driving onto it. Starting around 1950, the CIA developed an office specifically to deal with UFO sightings. You see, a lot of people were seeing things that they couldn't believe. And often they were seeing things that they just should not have been seeing. The first test flights of the U-2 spy plane, for example, were spotted in the Nevada desert and reported as UFOs. These sightings were replied to by the government with outright denial or vague, clumsy misdirection. This just fed into the public's paranoia and UFO appetite. The government released these statements because they had to misdirect the public. Not because they were hiding UFOs, but because they were hiding experimental aircraft, like the U-2 spy plane. In other words, the CIA took active, gleeful participation in creating a UFO mythology, because it distracted people from what they were really doing. Or is that just what they want us to think? Now, as we said earlier, one person's angel is another person's alien visitor. And so, it's not unusual to see that many people combined the two. Enter the UFO religion. In 1955, for example, in the United Kingdom, George King founded the Aetherius Society, which was a belief system based on an alien intelligence named, you guessed it, Aetherius. George King, the religion's founder, would sit and receive telepathic transmissions from Aetherius, who would take control of George's voice and have him speak while his disciples would record him on a reel-to-reel tape recorder. One thing that is interesting is that George King did predict future UFO sightings in some of his tape-recorded transmission receptions. Coincidence? Perhaps. Perhaps it is the very definition of coincidence. Claude Vorilon founded Realism. Under Realism, an extraterrestrial species known as Elohim created humanity through their technology. According to the devotees of Realism, the Elohim have created dozens of human-alien hybrids. These hybrids have served humanity as prophets, among them Jesus, Mohammed, Buddha, and Rael. Who's Rael, you ask? Oh yeah, Claude Vorilam, the religion's founder, changed his name to Rael and gave himself one heck of a promotion. The Unarius Academy of Science was founded in 1954 by Ernie and Ruth Norman, who believed they could communicate with advanced alien intelligence through the physics of fourth dimensional space. Ah, greetings, my friend. We are all interested in the future, for that is where you and I are going to spend the rest of our lives, whether we want to or not. L. Ron Hubbard, a sci-fi pulp writer, invented an outer space-based religion called Scientology, but nobody knows much about it, so let's move on. Even our old pal Criswell, from Plan 9 from Outer Space, dipped his beak in the intergalactic waters. Criswell's fame paralleled that of flying saucers, appearing in the late 40s and early 50s. By the mid-1950s, Criswell's column, Criswell Predicts, was featured in all manner of national newspapers and magazines. He appeared regularly on radio, etc., etc. He was known for predicting the future, and sometimes these predictions included UFO sightings and arrivals. He attended meetings of UFO abductees. Not just abductees attended these meetings. They were also chock full of looky-loos. So, according to the book, Fact, Fictions, and the Forbidden Predictions of the Amazing Criswell by Edwin Lee Canfield, Criswell, together with a guy named Max Miller, who published Flying Saucers International, decided to host the world's first Flying Saucer Convention in August of 1963. The convention was well attended and featured prominent ufologists 
as well as self-proclaimed contactees. As for the conventions, as well as the religions, if you ask me, UFO stood for Unbeatable Financial Opportunity. Sightings continued throughout the 1960s and 70s, In 1961, Betty and Barney Hill claimed they were abducted by six aliens and forced to submit to medical experiments. In 1965, in Exeter, New Hampshire, a teenager, as well as two police officers, saw a grouping of pulsing extraterrestrial craft. Their experiences went into the spooky book Incident at Exeter that I had as a kid, In 1969, the governor of Georgia would report seeing a mysterious, luminous, not solid light over Leary, Georgia. That particular Georgia governor, Jimmy Carter, would go on to become the president of the United States. In 1977, Steven Spielberg's follow-up to Jaws, Close Encounters of the Third Kind, premiered. It was one of those rare UFO films to depict aliens arriving on Earth as a gesture of friendship. By the 1970s, UFOs had become a Rorschach test for the national mood, at least in terms of how they were depicted in film. Afraid of the commies? War of the Worlds. Concerned about conformity? Invasion of the Body Snatchers. Speaking spiritual communion? Close encounters of the third kind. By this time, the conventional wisdom in the United States was fairly universal. UFOs exist. They crashed in Roswell, New Mexico. Their ship and their bodies were captured and being kept at Area 51. The more the government denied it, the more the people were concerned it was the truth. This belief took center stage in our pop culture in the 1990s when The X-Files became a hit television series. The X-Files was a show about government agents chasing UFOs despite the efforts of their own government to hamstring them. It was Close Encounters meets Watergate. It perfectly summed up the idiosyncratic UFO information loop. The government's case was not helped by the fact that the government did admit to lying in support of a cover-up just not a cover-up of UFOs. Something did crash near Roswell. It was not a UFO. Nor was it a weather balloon. It was a spy balloon, a part of Project Mogul that sent balloons high into the atmosphere to test for sound waves that would reveal whether or not the Soviet Union was or was not abiding by the rules of the Nuclear Test Ban Treaty. The idea that the U.S. government was hiding UFOs fed decades of pop culture and pop psychology until 9-11, when everyone realized that, hey, the government really wasn't on top of everything, were they? In fact, in this case, they were grotesquely, horribly out of the loop. And with the sudden presence of a very real, very terrestrial enemy, people, by and large, shoved their UFO fears aside. But in December of 2017, the New York Times carried a piece called Real UFOs? Pentagon Unit Tried to Know. The article told of a program buried within the Department of Defense and quoted a man named Luis Elizondo, who ran a small unit called Advanced Aerospace Threat Identification. Funding for this unit was arranged and confirmed to have been arranged by Senate Majority Leader Harry Reid. It was Reid's confirmation that gave the article its power. Additionally, It interviewed a Navy F-A-18 pilot named David Favor, who had an inexplicable close encounter with a lozenge-shaped craft that moved at an incredibly fast rate of speed. The New York Times online version of the story included a link to Favor's cockpit video, which showed a lozenge-shaped blip 
doing roughly what he described. So there it was, in the New York Times, an inflection point in the military and the government's approach to UFOs. From, no, you're wrong, it's nothing, to, yeah, it's something, we don't know what exactly, but it's definitely something. Shocking. Really. And the response from the public was equally shocking. After all those years of cover-up and speculation, the public was finally given the confirmation that it wanted, that it craved, that it demanded. The public's response? Oh. Yeah, okay. Settle back now, content, comfortable, well-fed, and ready for some fine entertainment. Is everybody happy? Then let's go. It's showtime. And now, on with the show. It's a sun dapple day high atop the Mulholland Drive view shelf here in sunny Southern California. We're recording from uh, Falcon's Lair Recording Studios, where Southern Hospitality is just west of East North Hollywood. And uh, my guest today is uh, a very talented singer-songwriter, I guess would be how you originally came to uh, the public's attention. Sure, yeah. Uh, the co-founder of uh, Azure Ray, which is one of the great bands out of the Saddle Creek scene. And has a new book out entitled The Witch's Daughter, which, although it sounds like it's seasonally Halloween-y, it's not. (laughs) 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 Or it isn't, it isn't, it isn't in, uh, in, uh, in a way that is not intended. Please welcome Orenda Fink. Thank you, Dana. You're known as a musician You have a great little indie career. You and your husband, uh, Todd Fink of The Faint, also from the Saddle Creek scene, you guys leave Omaha, Nebraska, and you move to the middle of the fucking desert. Yeah. And then COVID hits. Yes. Did this book come out of that isolation? Well, yes and no. Um... I actually started writing this book in earnest about eight years ago. Um, But at that time, it was really just basic vignettes of memories from my childhood. I wasn't quite sure what the story was. Mm -hmm. They were just recounting memories. And but but the what COVID did was and, you know, it's interesting. I think this probably happened for a lot of people. It kind of brought my more fraught relationships to the surface because, <laughs> <laughs> you know. We, well, that never happened to me. <laughs> um, it was that time where everyone was under, number one, such uh, extreme stress. But also we were isolated from each other to a certain degree. And so um, it really crystallized some of the uh challenges and issues with my relationship with my mother who the the core memories that I'd been writing about for eight years were really centered around and so it really was COVID that kind of pushed me I let's say pushed me to the edge really I mean it was the beginning of the end of our relationship yeah yeah I mean the the you the childhood you describe in the book I would describe as like Angela's ashes but Hard and dark. (laughs) (laughs) Wow. 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 Um, No, but it, 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 it it should be said, um, you, you didn't realize, you don't realize this when you're a kid because it's normal, but your, your mom had a mental illness. Yes. And you grow up with somebody who has a mental illness, but it's not told to you as a child. And you just think, this reality is terrible. Uh, I mean, as I, we, you know, I think everybody has 
a mild version of it in their life. Sure. Um, but but it is uh, it it is breathtaking when you step back from it. Uh, I'll, I'll I'll tell you a story, and it'll lead us hopefully into the origin of of your book. Uh, I was in a relationship with someone for six years when I was a young young man, and it was always it was always something. Uh, you know, broke up f- probably 53 times mm. over the six-year period. And I was in my therapist's office one day, and this is years later, years later. I'm married, I have kids, you know. I'm describing this person, and he, he gets a book off the shelf, and he opens it up, and he and he says, oh, re- read that, read that page. And it's just a list of personality traits. Mm-hmm. And I go, yeah, this is that person. This is them. This is like the Chilton manual that would come in their glove box. <laughs> right. And he said, well, look at the book. And it was the physician's desk reference, borderline personality oh, wow. disorder. Yeah. Uh, and that is what your mother was diagnosed with. Well, she was not diagnosed. That's she- what I said. <laughs> 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 so I'm sorry. She was she was not diagnosed with borderline psychosis. You thought it was borderline personality disorder because of a book that you read. Correct. Uh, well, you know, two two things. One is uh, about 10 years prior to, uh, re- you know, finishing the book, my therapist had suggested that she had borderline because she can't obviously diagnose someone that's not, she's mm-hmm. not seeing, but she suggested it. I read it like you did and was like, yep, that's it. But I, I was not able to really, um, I don't know, it didn't sink in at that time. I was just like, yeah, that's her. Right. Um, and I continued going full speed ahead into the madness for another decade. Right. It was during COVID that uh, after a big blow up with my mother that I, it, I, it just popped back into my head. And then I bought this book called Understanding the Borderline Mother. And that's when everything really started uh, coming together for me. So, so uh, you know, basically, she has not been diagnosed with borderline, but there is no doubt in my mind that she is an extreme case of borderline. She fits every single one of the criteria, and in particular, this very aggressive subtype called the witch um, that right. was coined, or, you know, uh, the term was created by uh, Dr. Christine Ann Lawson. Yeah, this isn't like, oh, this person's a witch. This is like a subdivision of a personality disorder that fits into a certain behavioral pattern. Yes, yeah. yes. Um, she also was a witch. Yes. Well, we, we talked about that because, uh, as was my mother, mm. uh, but, a, but a radically different take, um, but uh, was very much... Uh, Spooky. Spooky, even yeah. though she... What was her take? Um, she, my mother was raised in the sticks of Virginia in what's called a holler. Mm-hmm. Um, and was very much uh, like a Wiccan, like, a, you know, she was Christian, but uh, weird folk remedies, talking to ghosts, knowing ghosts. Um, dead, dead serious, like serious as a heart attack. But uh, my mother was also uh, incredibly kind, incredibly loving, incredibly empathetic. Uh, you know, she was uh, Glenda the Good Witch in that regard. I see. Uh, yeah, yeah. Um, uh, I used to say uh, we lived in this w- weird neighborhood where you know it was a it was a the baby boom, and there was a bunch of it was a hundred kids between 11 and 16 in this two block radius. We were just like a, like a herd and everybody's door was unlocked and we would just go into everybody's house. We didn't knock. We just went in. Um, and my mother would, as my friends would say, my mother would go from hello to sandwich in 30 seconds. Like <laughs> okay. You would walk into our house and say hello, and there would be a sandwich in front of you mm-hmm. almost immediately. You know, she was, she was that kind of person. I can only imagine as a child, because your parents' behavior to you when you're a kid is baseline. Your parents' behavior to you when you're a kid is, well, everybody, right. everybody's parents lives like this. Mm-hmm. But so people can can understand 
what is an example of the things that you had to endure as a kid from your mom that when you realize later, you're like, oh, that was so fucked up? <laughs> um, well, one, I mean, was the very consistent late night talks about witchcraft, mm -hmm. but a very dark type of witchcraft, right. not unlike uh, or unlike your mother, which was almost kind of a almost like a s sweet spirituality type of mm -hmm. witchcraft. My mother's was very dark, and she talked about the devil a lot, and yeah. uh, possession, and you know the devil claiming her children, and her revenge spells, and um, it, it it was like she a, just sounds Irish. <laughs> 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 yeah, revenge spells. Right. Yeah, okay. yeah. But but she would paint self portraits mm -hmm. that were. Like night gallery painting. Yes. Like, just tell tell us about that. <laughs> like I did this painting of me. What do you think? <laughs> yeah, yeah. So I mean, there's so many things, honestly. Um, and and on it, and, and crazily enough, they're not all even in the book. But um, she, yeah, she was a painter. She is a painter, and she would make these self portraits and some of them were extremely disturbing they were you know disembodied heads uh black eyes uh hair like you know uh, medusa snakes um bald head with horns coming out of her own head um and and and, and you know in some ways i feel it, as an adult i mean so she was doing these types of portraits from a very young age right. they they span over decades but as an adult, I started, um, I, you know, I, I have a lot of compassion for my mother, even though I'm no contact with her. And I do see, I understand the complexity of, of borderline and in the book and everything, you know, that I'm talking about is not to disparage, but um, there is a real, uh, it, it's a painful existence. And I do feel like even though in some ways she insisted that she was never the villain, uh, the other half of her really identified as the villain and embodied the villain. Sure. And so I feel like the portraits, the self-portraits of her as these kind of monstrous characters was her way to um, either express that or, or maybe even to say, fuck you, okay, I am a monster. I don't know. Yeah, that's really interesting because it could also be seen as a confession. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. But she's incapable of saying I'm sorry. Yeah, uh, uh, or yeah, or doesn't doesn't know that I'm sorry is a thing. Yeah. You let something slip in there. Um, you said that you and your mother are no contact. Yes. Um, so your mother's still alive. How? Yes. What year was your mother born? Oh, I don't know. Actually. She's a boomer, though, right? She's, she's I, I believe she's 77. Yeah, so she yeah. was a baby boomer. Mm -hmm. She was what one would call a hippie, like late yes. 60s, mm -hmm. early 70s. Um, and, and your dad as well. Yeah. Um, and, and that's, you know, as you get older, and I, you know, I, I went through my own version of this, when you, you know, you do start to step back and you have to see your parents as people. Mm -hmm. Um. And, and and try to to separate the things that they did to you from the things that were done to them, um, and and the world was so freakishly different from them. Uh, there's a thing in your book that really struck me that when your mother graduated high school, she had the choice between you could get a nose job or a bus ticket. Mm -hmm. Where where was she raised? Tuscaloosa. Alabama. Okay. The sticks. The sticks. The sticks. Yeah. Um, and I, I imagine that, you know, those are your only two ways out of your life. You get a nose job and hopefully you marry a rich dude or you can get the hell out of Dodge. Yes. Mm -hmm. And she went to New York. She did. Which is a really ballsy thing. This mm -hmm. was probably in the early 60s, late 50s. Mm -hmm. Yep, or, uh, early 60s, I think. Yeah, yeah, early 60s. And you must have admiration for that young woman. Yeah, and, and you know, I do. And I, I, it's, it's weird in some way. I mean, 
there's other things I have admiration for her um, about too. I mean, that she's an artist, you know, and she's eccentric and she's always really just been her um, with no apology. But, you know, there's the flip side of that. Yeah, but that's that. Manson too. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> the one thing you can't deny about Charles Manson. He was unapologetic. He lived his truth. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yes. Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, but... Uh, but no, that was a very brave thing of, of her to do. Yeah. Uh, and but people who have no choices will do brave things. That's true. That's true. I don't think she had a choice. It, you know, no. If yeah. you don't want to get married and be a, you know, get married to somebody from Tuscaloosa and be a mom at 18, 19. Right. She couldn't conform. She certainly couldn't conform to, and it wasn't even Tuscaloosa. It was a small rural area sure. outside of Tuscaloosa. Right. Um, and so she must have known that to some degree, that, that she had to get out. But the weird thing is that she, as soon as she met my father, she returned. She went back to the farm mm-hmm. uh, almost immediately, like right after uh, she became pregnant with me. So in some ways, you know, she did go away to meet my father, but then she went straight back to the rural South and then really never left. Yeah, because you were raised also in Alabama, correct? Yes. And are you the oldest? Middle. Middle. Okay. Mm-hmm. You have an older sister, Charlotte. Correct. And a younger sister, Christine. Yes. Um, you you mentioned your father. That's the other really complicated thing mm-hmm. in this. Uh, because your dad is seems to be a normal dude, nice guy. Um much more of a maternal figure than your mother. Mm-hmm. Uh, but do you wonder, like, well, is he a, is he loyal? Is he complicit? Is he, you know, like, do you, is there anger? Like, you're no contact with your mom for your own emotional survival. Yes. Is that fair that, to say? That is fair to say. Are you no contact? But you're not no contact with your father. Also no contact with my father. Also no contact yeah. with your father. Um. By, by choice, or is that the only way you can do it? Well, you know, when you when you, no contact is, you know, it's it it's a big deal. Yeah, you know, I it, can't imagine. I mean, it. Uh, you know, it just like you talk about the the first the opening of the book is you having a screaming fight with your mother. Mm-hmm. I could not imagine doing that with either parent. Like, yeah. And my brother, too. It's like, we've never talked back. We would get killed. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Like it, the idea of screaming at either of my parents is not on the menu. Yeah, and it's interesting. It's like, it. It. I've only done it a few times, a handful of times. And it, it generally would not be on my menu either. But I was pushed so far to the brink right. each time that, you know, it's it's literally like I became someone else, you know? No, yeah. You know, and from my own experience with borderline, if, if that's what it is. Right. Potential. With extreme personalities. Let's say, yes. Yeah. One of the traits that I see in retrospect is... They're looking for the boundary. Mm -hmm. And so they just keep pushing until they find the boundary. Your breaking point. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it must have been without having a, this is not a political conversation. This is a personality type question. It must have been very strange for you to live under Trump because there is another completely I think borderline personality. I mean, there are many disorders. I think there. he's narcissistic yeah. personality, but but, but, yeah. but malignant narcissism, mm-hmm. like clinical malignant narcissism, and the the country goes along with it the way a family goes along with it. Mm-hmm. You know. Well, I think because we, right, okay. so the the rules of the rules of our socialization require that we accommodate. 
Well, yes, I agree with that too. But also, you know, don't underestimate the power of these personalities. And, um, you know, when we talk about borderline, there is, you know, it, it actually gets more complicated even than kind of what I understood when I wrote the book not too long ago, which is there's there's also narcissistic personality disorder and they kind of link in together like yeah. a Venn diagram. Yeah. So, but it, it's really the uh, narcissistic uh, structure that I feel like creates the the thing we're talking about the baiting, mm -hmm. uh, the pushing to the brink, uh, having people explode, uh, the manipulation, the gaslighting. If you talk about yeah. Trump and even you know in my experience with my mother, yeah, borderline is 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 just kind of to me it's a version of that. Uh, it doesn't always have to have the narcissistic piece to it, but it's it's got this very um, deep depth of emotion and shame to it that narcissistic personality doesn't it's like trump is more of a grandiose narcissist mm -hmm. you know he thinks he's the shit right and he is very controlling and successful and um and whereas in my mother i feel like felt very uh powerless in and uh scared to be abandoned right you know and she would kind of but but the, but the scaffolding of the narcissism can be the same Right, but both those personality types, uh, both of those things, are based in fear and insecurity. They are like he is yes. a grandiose narcissist because he is terrified of being seen as anything. Sure. But you yeah. know, it's yeah. as the the book that I read, The Wizard of Oz, and other narcissists. It's, right, it's the guy behind the curtain is the guy he's terrified that people will see. Yeah, yeah, and so yeah. you're yeah, you're correct about that. Yeah. And and the thing is is that these are uh the these are the personality disorders of cult leaders. Uh, yeah. many cult leaders have uh NPD or BPD and that it's it's a it's a they command a lot of respect and fear and it's easy to get people hooked into what they're selling. Yeah. Um, because a lot of us want that. We want someone to tell us what to do and to look yeah. up to us, especially if it's your parent, you know? Yeah. And I mean, the cult leader thing, it's true. It's like people don't decide to become cult leaders. They're born cult leaders. Right. <laughs> you know, and, so. and, and people don't decide to be cult members. Uh, there's a, this great quote. I um, I can't remember the guy, the, his name right now, but he um, was one of the Nexium whistleblowers. Oh, really? Uh, and he said, uh, you know, I didn't join a cult, I joined a good thing. So talk about Trump, you know, I think like their followers really do believe that he's, he's the one, he's a good yeah. guy. You know, yeah. there is nothing, you know, inherently nefarious about the followers, maybe some of them, sure. Sure. But I think a lot of them actually just kind of buy the, you yeah. Know, I mean, it, drinking the Kool-Aid. Yeah, it's it's many so things. So to speak. It's, yeah, it's many things. <laughs> yeah, interesting pun. Um, <laughs> uh, analogy. Uh, yeah, there's so much of it is just Red Sox Yankees. I'm a Republican, so I like the Republican. Like, everyone in my family is a Republican. Uh, they all hated Trump during the primaries in 2016. But they thought he was an asshole. Because mm -hmm. they were real George Bush, right. Ronald Old Reagan school. Republicans. Yeah. And then he became the president, and they all was like, no, he's the guy. Mm. He's the guy. Now, is that tough? For, that's got to be tough for you. Or is I, it well, it's, again, it's nothing new. Right. And uh, I, and I say, uh, you know, to their credit, we don't talk about it. They they We don't. We don't talk about it. Mm -hmm. They're pretty great about it. That's that's good. Yeah, that's no good. chicken fighting. I, right. you know, it's like, you know, Happy Halloween. Tell you what, I'm afraid of Nancy Pelosi. Okay, great. <laughs> you, li you listen to the radio today. Good, good. <laughs> um, but yeah, there there is that you know, cult leader mentality that, uh, that dr that that draws people in, and it, and it's a symbiotic relationship. You know. Mm -hmm. The follower feels part of a thing that's greater than themselves, and cared for and taken care of, and they feel they belong. And the leader has the uh, the self esteem buttressing that you get from having followers. 
Yeah, you know? yeah. And it gives them a sense of purpose, too. Yeah. Um, and I feel I feel like that, you know, so, so back to my, my father, who I do believe is... Um, is your mother a cult leader and your father's one of her followers? Yeah, yeah, basically. I mean, well, in, 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 in you know, psychological terms... Of course, of course. Yeah, she yeah. has a personality disorder. She Maybe she has a narcissistic personality uh, style, and he would be the codependent. Right. You know, someone yeah. who's kind of born to hook into this and caretake and protect no matter what. Um, and, and I think with the two of them, they almost, they're, they are symbiotic. They, they, I feel like they're so connected with their complexes. They hook in so well that their children, they don't even see their children as some, you know, I don't think my father ever saw it as a possibility to leave my mom to protect his children. Right. We're more outside than they are. Yeah. That's yeah. the thing that I can't wrap my head around. It's um, sad. Yeah. It's really sad. It is. And and he seems to be aware of it. He's he's yeah, I think he's somewhat aware of it. Yeah. And and aware that he's making this choice. Yeah. You know, it, yeah, it it it's it's pretty it's painful to even think about it that he he has that awareness, but he's still making the choice. Right. You know. Right. But you you know, you talk about uh, uh, witchcraft, like being raised in the South, l like uh, my mom. Um, there is a lot of uh, belief in the supernatural, witchcraft and ghosts. Uh, tell me about your grandfather, Otha. So Otha um, was actually my great grandma, uh, great grandfather. He was my mother's he was your great grandfather. He was my great grandfather, okay. my mother's grandfather. But I just called him my grandfather too because I kind of skipped a grandfather. I didn't have a grandfather. I never knew him. He died okay. before I was born. Um, but he, I don't know him that well. I just, you know. But it's interesting because uh, my mother always said he was uh, the son of a Native American woman and followed these Native American spiritual tra traditions on the farm. But, uh, you know, I don't want to, I don't know if I'm supposed to spoil or alert the book. <laughs> Does it matter? <laughs> no, I think. Um, but all of those were lies. Sure. Um, there was no Native American, you know, great, great grandmother. There was no Native American calls on the farm. That was pr uh, proved to be false by DNA tests. And even with the DNA test, my mother couldn't uh, cop to the fact that it was a lie. She still maintained it was true, even after it was disproved by ancestry. So, you know, people want to be special. They do, and and I think honestly, those lies. Um, I I see why she came up with that story. Um, I think she did want to be special, and I think she wanted to. She hated her father, and she had her father's nose. Oh. And it was a prominent nose. You could, someone could say it looks like a Native American right. uh, okay. yeah, yeah. Uh, nose. But so she wanted to make up the story that there was this, you know, beautiful, uh, honorable Native American heritage that she carried. And that's why her nose looked like that. But in fact, it was her uh, alcoholic abusive father's nose. And he wasn't Native American. Nobody was. Yeah. So it was like she made up this origin story to uh, explain. She, I, I don't think she liked to look like him. Well, yeah, yeah, it's interesting. She saw in her own face the face of the person that abused her, was given an option. You can get a nose job or you can leave town. Mm -hmm. She chose to leave town and then gave herself a psychological nose job. Exactly. Like giving the nose a different meaning. Right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's, that's so interesting. Yeah, yeah. I never thought about that. That's really clever. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> clever. Nice one. Clever lady. Um, but did you see your uh, grandfather, your great-grandfather Otha after he passed? Yes, as a ghost. Yes. Yeah. That was my first memory, was seeing him outside my window on the farm in Tuscaloosa and at that time, I didn't know he was a ghost. So it, it's interesting. It's, it's it's my first memory, and it truly, uh, you know, wasn't till you know I was older that I realized that I did not have a conversation with him. That it was that he was deceased at the time that I remember 
seeing him and right but you did see him you fervently believe you saw him oh yeah Yeah. i mean he you know i describe it in the book he was playing peekaboo and pulling his lips back and i i see all that yeah fully yeah Mm -hmm. and i'm not and i by the way i totally believe you right i mean yeah no i mean there's some stuff that's there are things that you believe in because they're fun right you know bigfoot the Hulk. <laughs> well, I guess they're different. <laughs> but you know, like, but I fervently believe that there, are, you know, there's there's energy can be left behind by a life force that can manifest in certain ways, and and I absolutely believe that there's the universe is full of stuff we can't understand. Mm-hmm. You know, it's like Carl Sagan has that famous quote about. The infinitesimal nature of humanity in the universe, mm, mm-hmm, and mm-hmm. and and the belief that we are the center of the universe. I believe the word he uses is it's ridiculous. <laughs> right. You know? I talk about my mother's diary in the book, um, and I didn't put this. In in there, um, you know, I chose to uh, focus on specific passages, but one of her passages in the diary is that story of finding me in the window talking to Granddaddy Otha. Right. Um, and so there, you know, you could beg the question: Was that memory planted in my mind? Because it is in the diary. I didn't get the diary till I was third thirty nine or something. But but maybe I was told that story. I'm not sure. I don't. Oh yeah, I see what you're saying. You know, yeah. I don't remember being told that story. I just, I, but I have a distinct memory of it. But once I was, uh, once I read her diary, you know, 40 years later, that story is in it. I know identical twins that have had psychic events between the two of them mm. mm-hmm. uh, as children. Uh, I know their parents, and their parents are not airy fairy. They're super business people. <laughs> right. Um, yeah, exactly. They're they're but, not making it up. No, they had uh and they you know one this happened to one twin, the other one wasn't with him. And two days later this one started talking about this thing that they did not know about or not at, you know. It's just like um So yeah, I I absolutely believe that there are things there that we can't we can't uh talk about. Your mo- your mom like my mom, had uh, a nervous breakdown when you were a kid, mm-hmm. had to go to the hospital, what my brother called slipper school. Um, <laughs> Mom's in slipper school. That's good. Um, when she, uh, you're how old now? You're a kid. Yeah, I was five. Yeah, you don't understand that. No. You don't understand your parents are broken. No. Doesn't make a lick of sense. No. And... You tell a story that your mom, who brought your mom to the church for someone to lay hands upon her? Someone that my father worked with. So I imagine that um, he must have been talking to his friend at work about his wife who's having some major problems um psychologically By the way, very common yeah yeah totally yeah. and that 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 man said hey i go to this church we you know we're we're quote unquote seers seers um and uh you know we can we help people so my dad was just like okay sure let's take her right and um and it was at you know at that church Just like evangelical evangelical yeah right. like speaking in tongues and snakes and, uh, I don't think there were snakes at this one. Never mind. Didn't <laughs> 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 <Ten> deliver. <laughs> I got my hopes up. <laughs> but something super interesting happened to your mom when yeah. at this laying laying of hands. Yes. Yeah, so there was an old woman who uh, la- laid her hands on my mother and uh, started basically telling her about some of her previous injuries, you know, that there's no way she could have known about. 
And so it was almost like she was uh, laying the groundwork for being believable, you know. But, sure. Yeah. Uh, you know, you had you had this you have this pain here. You had this car accident yeah. here, and yeah. and then and then at the end, she says she kind of pulls back from her and says, "You have a devil on your shoulder." Right. And and that is what I understood uh, overhearing a conversation that my father had about why my mother ultimately, you know, had the nervous breakdown where she had to. Uh, I mean, she tried to commit suicide and then was put in a mental institution because of. This. Believing that she was basically possessed. Yeah, yeah, that there yeah. was a devil on her. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, I find that, and then you later started going to church. Was that individuation? <laughs> I mean, I think all of it's been individuation mm-hmm. in its own way, but... Well, you um, had two choices, nose job or a bus ticket. <laughs> <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> And so, yeah, my individuation was, I, was, I mean, I was moved around so much. I was always kind of like, you know, that, that, that children's book, Who's My Mommy or Are You My Mommy? You know, mm-hmm. like I was trying to figure out what scene to fit in that would get me out of this hellhole, you know, even though I didn't even know it was a hellhole. Uh, so, so I was five when right. she went to the hospital for the first time. Right. Um, and, but then, yeah, later I did end up, going to uh to a church right let's say uh it was a, a you know it was very different it wasn't a pentecostal church it wasn't evangelical it was a very um let uh conservative first ba- southern first baptist church right. you're in alabama yeah right um no speaking in tongues it was it was kind of where all the respectable people in the town went right and um, yeah, it, it 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 I was looking for some place to fit in, some place to uh, you know maybe pull me out of the situation, but ultimately it wasn't for me. I didn't I didn't stay long. Well, there's a thing in the book. I'm going to read it because there's. I mean, this is a. I don't want people to get the wrong idea of your book. It's, it's, it, it's certainly uh, very, very. Uh, uh, personal and uh, and conf- and con- uh, confessionary to make up a word, but it's also insanely entertaining. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, I mean, it's it, it real. I mean, it really is. And there's some stuff in here that I bark laughed at. Um, one of them was right here. Just I'll get to the one I was going to read. Uh, this is a great example of where I will cut. Uh, Here's one talking about uh, your father uh, dated a woman named Sheila. Mm-hmm. And then he uh, left Sheila for Sheila's friend, who became your mother. Correct. But he and Sheila remained friends. Mm-hmm. And this is a quote from the book. He left Sheila shortly after for my mother, but my parents remained good friends with her. They even visited her together when she landed in Bellevue Hospital after a bad acid trip that resulted in her professing Jesus Christ was her new lover and quenching her thirst with a bottle of Drano. <laughs> it was a different time. It was. It was. And, you know, and, and this was uh, told to me as, as you know, a, a fun family anecdote. Sure. <laughs> yeah, they don't, they don't, they don't. I don't know. I once asked my mother how they got my name because it was it, Dana was a guy's name when I was born in 64. It was it became a woman's name in the 70s. I okay, think. didn't yeah, know that. It was a dude's name. And uh originally my name was going to be Keith. And uh I asked my mother I said, "Where did you guys get Dana?" And my mother, oh, you were named after your father's friend who killed himself. <laughs> oh, well, thank you much. Great. Good to know. <laughs> Member of the team. Uh, this is another great quote that is, uh, speaks to what we were just talking about. I quit church. Our youth group leader started dropping the N-word. <laughs> Yeah. Hell ain't that America. Something to see, babe. Yeah. As I said to the legal team at Simon & Schuster, unfortunately, all of this is true. Yeah, they can't sue me. (laughs) This is all true. Um, What are blue devils? 
Not amphetamines. <laughs> yeah, not pills. So th- that's something that my mother coined, and she used to call that what her father would be possessed by uh, when he started drinking and getting mean. Uh-huh. That he had that the blue devils were visiting, and um, and that is something that you know I discuss in the book that that she never had the self awareness to know that the blue devils visited her too. Right. Sure. Yeah. Right. Yeah. I. It's really sadly common mm-hmm. that people don't see the thing that you, you mentioned in the book, uh, the things that haunt them. You know, mm-hmm. people are haunted and they don't realize that the things that haunt them, they are than inflicting on other people. <laughs> right. You know. Yeah. And and sometimes they don't have a choice. Sometimes it's an active choice. And then there are the people that go, this ends here. You know? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Uh, this isn't going to continue. Right. Your mother bought you your first guitar. Mm-hmm. Um, and the the story in the book is is really how you know music was your bus ticket. Mm-hmm. Y- your your love of music and your talent is the thing that propelled you out. Yes. Um, I I had that with being a clown, <laughs> you know. But it was it was the mm-hmm. it was the thing that got me out. Yeah, making people laugh. But it got me out of there. It it drove me out of my hometown, moved to move to do things that I was really afraid to do. Go to a strange city, live in somebody's walk-in closet, basically. <laughs> right. Um, you know, and 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 build. Uh, you know, it it was a motivator that put that shit in the rearview mirror. Mm-hmm. Um. And it's such a blessing to have. Um, it would have been a great story if your mom gave you a guitar and you used it to get away. But the thing that complicates it is your mother then became really jealous of your guitar. <laughs> right. <laughs> <laughs> Which is right out of the textbook. It is. I was going to say it really is out of the uh, out of the narcissistic yeah. textbook. Yeah. Mhm. Um how did your parents react to your success? I mean your your first your your first band was you you ended up in Athens. Mhm. And you were in Athens, Georgia at the right it's just right place at the right time. Yeah. You know, and about what year was this? And what are the what are the bands that are around? This is after REM mm-hmm. and B fifty twos and stuff. But like, what are the bands that are around Athens when when you get there? Uh, we got there in nineteen ninety nine, I believe ish, um, and there were so many great bands. I mean, the the Elephant Six uh, Collective was starting to really gain traction. What is that? Uh, that's uh, Neutral Milk Hotel, Olivia Trimmer Control of Montreal, Apples and Stereo. These are all bands that I know of primarily from my bit of bands that became successful after Johnny Carson quit The Tonight Show. <laughs> because I really wish I could have heard Johnny Carson going, Neutral Milk Hotel is here. <laughs> That would have been amazing. <laughs> neutral, and then, <laughs> neutral Milk Hotel. <laughs> have you heard of them yet? <laughs> oh, my God. This is great. Um, there is also uh, Danger Mouse was coming yeah, up he was, uh, at that time. Yeah. And now he's, you know, in, insanely huge. He's Danger um, Mouse. He's Danger Mouse. <laughs> yeah. Um, there was a band called The Glands that was wonderful. Vic Chestnut, Phosphorescent. Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, uh, Elf Power, 
uh, just it, it, the list goes on and on and on. So you're there, and you yeah. end up either uh, forming or joining a band called Little Red Rocket. Okay, yes. We actually uh, had formed Little Red Rocket in Birmingham. Okay. By the time we got to Athens, we had already been on a major label. We had been on Geffen and gotten dropped. Right. And when we... And, and this is you and Maria Taylor primarily, or there's four or five people in... Uh, it was always... Maria and I were the core duo. Of, right. Of, you fronted it. We fronted it. And we did have different band members, different bass player and drummers that um, were in a couple of different incarnations right. of Little Red Rocket through the years. And then um, who were all amazing people. And what, once we switched over to Azure Ray, it just became Maria and I, and we just kept it the duo. Right. Yeah. It's really interesting because music it doesn't work like comedy in, in that regard. Like there is this thing in music where you're a band and someone sees you and you get a golden ticket to the Wonka factory, you know, <laughs> yes. like you're going to be on Geffen and you're flown out to LA and you're given money and they like, go get some clothes, look like rock stars. And you're thinking, Oh, this is it. Yeah. This is it. We're famous now. Wait, that doesn't happen in comedy. No, <laughs> I have a, I have a, I have a story like that, but, uh, you, you don't get the, you know, there's not, there's no signing, you know, you get a, I mean, it's different. Right, you right. get a deal, yeah. I guess. And you get a manager. I mean, I, I mean, I, or maybe I just feel this way because I've had so many of those tickets and they've all blown up in my face. Well, I um, mean, same. <laughs> yeah. Um, but yeah, well, that's the thing. Then you get, you get. You you get you got dropped by Geffen before you recorded your album. Yeah. Um, you and Maria, you're in L.A. You're told to go buy clothes to look like rock stars. You buy these clothes that you say in the book made you look like <laughs> prostitutes. Basically, yeah. someone uh, actually thought we were prostitutes. Yeah. But it's just, you wear like a leather mini skirt and yeah, it's. That's not your sound, but that's not even like Little Red Rocket's sound. Like, what were you, what were you thinking? <laughs> we weren't. I mean, we just. <laughs> Wait, that's the perfect answer. Yeah, we, we we literally were dropped off on um, Santa Monica. Yeah, Melrose. Yeah. And uh, at this store, and they, you know, were familiar with with the Geffen credit right. card. So is it like, um, was it? Cause I I was on Mel I know Melrose really well I know that year really well was it like Aardvark or Wasteland I'm I'm trying to like name the no, store no it you wasn't read. Wasteland I don't know what the name of it was but it was an older woman actually uh -huh. and she was just picking out stuff and sure telling you did know, you go in like we just signed to Geffen well she yeah she knew that they called ahead oh of they time. called ahead yeah yeah oh okay yeah, that's yeah. even that's even more interesting they right. could, they said dress our I, dress our girls well, are that's coming how in. I remember off the double chat with Maria but yeah. I I have the had the memory that they you know they kind of knew we were coming right and and so we you know she was really just helping us and grabbing sure. stuff off the racks and putting it in and and so we weren't really even picking anything out yeah. we liked how we dressed sure. So we didn't really have a vision for what he wanted. We didn't know what he wanted, you know? Sure. So we thought, well, maybe this one. You know, I, I guess I figured she was a stylist or something. Yeah. So we but walk it, out of there with our vinyl tank tops and mini skirts and... It's interesting you say that, though, because like you are you were signed to a record label and you're sent to Melrose to, and you're dressed by somebody. I dress the way the bands that I loved when I was coming of age dressed. Mm. <laughs> specifically right. like, you know it's like no i'm gonna look like i could just walk in with weezer if they got off the bus like that's what i do yeah it's like, so it's it's sort of like a snake eating its own tail it is and i'm sure that they probably dress themselves and we did too after that so yeah, it's it like works. you want to dress like the people who do dress themselves like i don't yeah. think anyone that actually goes through this style sure. machine you look like you look dumb you know like yeah we didn't look like anybody that would really want to you know there well, was no style to emulate it's interesting that you say that because then you go to dinner with your a and r guy from geffen mm -hmm. uh and he i get whether it was like you just happened to be tagging along at dinner or he's doing a flex 
uh, he invites Courtney Love to come to dinner with you. And this is 99, 2000. Mm -hmm. So she's big. She's big. And she's a delight, a study in manners. Yeah. She's exactly. <laughs> um, and she says that you guys aren't going to make it because you're not, you're too nice. Um, well, she, I think he said that we were too nice. She just said we'd never make it. I, I wouldn't put those words in her mouth. She just said we, we would not make it. And he passed that information on. And his, uh, his advice was that we were too nice. Mm -hmm. That's kind of like someone saying, I don't think you take enough drugs. <laughs> <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I believe that she said that, and I believe that she believed it, but she also strikes me as someone who knew exactly what it took to get successful. Mm -hmm. I did love that record, Live Through This. Sure. Um, and so it was a very interesting, you know, and I kind of, say it in the book it was like it was very disappointing to get to have this kind of idol of mine basically take a big shit on us just from being around us at a dinner but at the same time i was like but she knows who i am yeah i get <laughs> you know? that and you're and you're from you guys are from athens yeah and, yeah when you heard from your a and r guy that courtney love didn't think you were going to make it because you were too nice were you like, well, we have to become assholes, or well, I guess we're fucked? <laughs> I, we were more like we're fucked. <laughs> yeah. I mean, we we really we laughed about it. I mean, we laughed at his in his face. Yeah. Uh, we just you know kind of pretended like he was kidding because I mean honestly you know I just that we're so not that we never yeah. were that yeah. there was no even way to approximate it. Yeah. So. Um, By you the know, way, isn't she's. She's friends with Michael Stipe or was friends with Michael Stipe. Uh, Courtney Love. Yeah. Yes. Isn't he famously nice? He's very nice. <laughs> See? Yes. He, they, I know some of the guys from REM. Yeah. They're all nice. Oh, no. They're amazing. <laughs> yeah, yeah, so it doesn't make any sense. Yeah. I, I think. By honestly, the way, Elvis Presley seemed very nice. Are you, well, yeah. yeah. That, that's, so I think that, yeah. you know. Unless maybe you were a peanut butter sandwich. She might have been jealous. You know, of and, and maybe, you know, even I, I kind of feel like, well, she did ultimately have a relationship with with our mutual A&R guy. Uh -huh. And, um, you know, I don't know, you know, he may or may not have had a little crush on Maria. And I think it was more uh, she yeah. was jealous. But know? there are people that there are people that like to stir up shit because it's fun. Right. To them. Yeah. yeah. You get dropped by Geffen, not because of anything you did but because they got sold to Interscope and they kind of like cleared the decks. Mm -hmm. When you and Maria either left Little Red Rocket or Little Red Rocket dissolved, you formed Azure Ray and became indie darlings, uh, some of the progenitors of what became known as Whisper Corps, <laughs> uh, became big members of the Saddle Creek scene. Did you ever... Talk to them later. Did they ever go like, oh, I missed my boat. I missed my guess. You guys, did you ever get that? Uh, from, from. Your A&R guy? Oh, no, I never talked to him again. Uh-huh. Um, but, uh, I know some people have kept in touch with him. Um, I think he probably wished us well. Yeah. Um. I know who he is. You do? Yeah. yeah. And I okay. know he had an interesting life event. After that? Yes. <laughs> yes. I mean, I was in the tabloid. What was your family of origins reaction to your success? Well, you know, that's a complicated one. There were times, um, you know, certainly times that I felt like uh, supported and you know, always just kind of supported in general. Like, definitely what I didn't have the family that was like, don't go into music or anything like that, mm -hmm. uh, which some people do have to contend with that. But there was this kind of 
undercurrent, which was a very similar pattern from the past of not being supported and, you know, not really no one coming to my shows and not feeling like I could really tell my family exactly how good things were going. Yeah. Um, so it's kind of like I would come back and visit and, and my success was ignored, you know. Yeah, to, I can relate to you, that. You can, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it's, it's, it's funny. There are people that are threatened by your success. Mm -hmm. And that's hard. It is hard because it's like, you know, when when you think about success, there's all varying degrees of it. You know, mm -hmm. it's like I think of myself in some ways as a success, obviously, you know, compared to uh, how I grew up. But then there's I have friends that are way more successful sure. than me, you know, yeah. like. And so in that in those regards, I can feel like a total failure. <laughs> Right, completely. It's you know? never it never ends. You yeah, know? yeah, yeah. And and so it is difficult to be in that maybe that that middle ground or below middle ground and and not be able to share that with the the people that you love and to even have to hide it to some degree or feel like it sets you apart. And I also feel like there was I don't know if you feel this way too, but because of that, uh, you know, at Attribu attribution of success it's also like uh, your problems don't exist either and no one, yeah you know like yeah. you're you're not human anymore you know like they're they could they don't even ask you how you are or because yeah, they're afraid they're going to hear something they don't want to hear hmm. you know they don't want you to be doing too well and then or and, too poorly right i guess yeah. but so yeah it puts you in this very isolated position the, the thing that I found interesting, I don't know if you've ever looked at this, is you uh, you meet uh, Todd mm -hmm. on a tour, right? Mm -hmm. uh, he's in The Faint, which is a big Saddle Creek band. Uh, you you first meet and then you, you kind of don't click. And then you click later when you're on tour. And then you're together every day, all day. Right. For a month. Mm-hmm. And then when you guys moved to the desert together, COVID hits. Mm -hmm. So you, you, you're already married at that point, but correct? Oh yeah, by yeah, right. 19 years. Right. But the weird thing is you've had these periods in your relationship when you go into a new phase where you're together an unnatural amount of time <laughs> mm -hmm. it happened more than once uh starting to date while on tour and then relocating to the middle of nowhere and suddenly you're the only two people alive right because you can't see or talk to anybody else um that's it's a testament to your relationship that you got through all that Mm hmm. Yeah. It, and, and, you know, he's been such a gift to me. I mean, it's like of all the, you know, let's say the the challenges of my childhood and my parents, you know, I do have to recognize the, the gifts that I've been given. And I have, yeah. you know, an amazing sister, amazing friends and the most amazing husband. He just fits with me and all of my yeah. You know, all of my eccentricities and uh, I think strengths and challenges. So we work really well together. I mean, it's not to say we haven't like, you know, had down times. Well, of yeah, course. yeah, you're, you're human. But yeah. Um, but yeah, no, it's like we do work really well together. And that's why I really did realize during COVID too, when once I was isolated from everybody but Todd, I got a sense of who I actually was. Well, yeah, and it's not like you're isolated from everybody in Brooklyn or in here. Mm -hmm. I've been to your home. Right, <laughs> yeah. You're isolated in a house on the moon. Yeah. You know, uh, there's an episode of The Twilight Zone called The Lonely. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't know if you're familiar mm -hmm. with it. Yeah, yeah, okay. You live that. Yeah. Uh, you live that. And so you're alone. You don't see anybody 
And the only person you do see is like the Amazon guy and he's masked up. So it, it had to really be an incredibly surreal experience. I, at the height of COVID, I went out every day. Oh, wow. Oh, wow. Yeah. Oh, yeah. we had a very different, uh, yeah. very different reality. No. no, I, it was surreal. I mean, I called it my rust and coal period, you know, from True Detective. Sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I was just, you know, sitting on the cigarettes or si sitting on the cigarettes, <laughs> Florian slip, uh, <laughs> sitting on the porch, just smoking cigarettes and drinking tequila like, all night long, <laughs> staring at the stars and the moon, wondering, like, time is a flat circle. What's going to happen? Like, is it over? Is this over? Is, is this it? Yeah, is this it? Yeah. Like, No, I was doing things like painting trees and... <laughs> People have to know what a tree looks like. I'll do it. <laughs> no, I mean actually painting a tree. I had a dead oh, you painted an yeah, actual tree. There, there was a dead tree. Not a tree. portrait of a tree. No, there was a dead tree in our yard and I painted it. Yeah. <laughs> you know, so yeah, things were getting a little weird over there, but... <laughs> yeah. yeah, no, it, I, 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 but I did find that interesting that you went through these incredibly... Um, strange periods of mutual uh, co-isolation. Mm -hmm. Well, that's what being a touring musician is like. I'm sure it's yeah. the same. Or, or is it? Do you ever, I mean, how often do you get in a bus with people? Never. It's yeah. totally okay. isolated. Okay. It's totally solitary. Well, that's its, that's its own thing, too. Yeah, it's not great. Yeah. yeah. It's why I, a lot of, um, it, it's good because, you know, I mean, some comedians do that. They, they'll book a giant tour and get an opener and they'll go in their bus. Mm -hmm. Just like a musician. For somebody at my level, I just travel alone, go to the hotel. See, that sounds like a dream to me. I find the first day crushingly lonely because I'm well, used yeah. to my kids. Yeah, and you I, have, I have a giant, animals yeah. and kids. Yeah, yeah animals and kids. I just feel and, terribly yeah. lonely. And the second day, I really dig it. <laughs> <laughs> <All right. laughs> but then on the third day, I'm ready to go home. And I okay. usually go home on the third or fourth day. Oh, okay. Yeah. The book is called The Witch's Daughter. I was going to say The Daughter of the Witch. Um, <laughs> the book is called The Witch's Daughter. It's out now. What do you, what do you, when you, when you finish the book, you're, you're at this chapter in your life, no pun intended, where you've completely individuated from your parents mm -hmm. and you're and not fully from your family of origin. Um, you're very close with your sister. Yes. Um, but not to play the pun, uh, did you feel like this chapter in your life is closed? Or is this, this is what happened up to now. We'll see what happens. Do you think that your situation now with your parents is permanent? I take it day by day. Mm-hmm. Um, the advice that my therapist gave me, and she's a wonderful therapist, is uh, ask yourself this question every day. Yeah. You know, this isn't, uh, you didn't sign a contract in blood that you're going no contact. You can, um, you can always revisit this you know, no matter what day or yeah. what the conditions are. So, so I think that's a really beautiful way to look at it. And, you know, my sister does too, that this is a choice that you make every day. It's not one that you make right. one day and that, that one day at a time. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. Um, but, but I do think that, uh, the, the boundaries will never go back to where they were. And I, sure. I think it's probably likely that i will remain no contact. But um, like I said, I just think it's important to be able to give yourself the freedom to say, I'm going to assess this every day. Right. And uh, is, where are you musically now? Is, I, are you writing for you and Maria or are you writing for yourself or? I think I'm retired from music. Really? Yeah. Um, I love writing and I want to write another book and I love coaching. I, I, I coach people now. Mm -hmm. Um, that's why you have the whistle. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I'm a football coach. <laughs> no, I'm, I'm a Jungian depth coach and I specialize in dream interpretation. Um, and I love that. So I'll make you feel Carl <laughs> Young again. Uh. I love Carl Young. That's my, that's my celebrity crush. Yeah, that's hilarious. Um, but, 
So that, you know, never, again, never say never, but that's where I'm putting my focus yeah. right now. So no, yeah, not doing I, anything with yeah. music. Uh, anyway, the book is called The Witch's Daughter, Arenda Fang. Thanks so much. Thank Thanks you. So much. Thank you so much. Available at one of America's five bookstores. Other podcasts reach for the sky. Dana Goldbaum. We barely try. This has been the Dana Gould Hour, brought to you by the Internet. Music by Andy Paley, with Jake Posner behind the board. Produced by Jeff Fox. Graphic design and web production by Spencer Hunt and Segan Friend. Sound editing and post-production by Jalinda Palmer and Joe Napolitano. Tom Kenny speaking. I'm a DJ, I'm a DJ, I'm a person, I'm a person, I'm a singer, I'm a singer, I love to sing, and DJ... Boom! Peace out! Peace out! You want me? Peace out! Boom!